Today is Tuesday, September 8th, 2020. Uh, today we're going to finish up our blood vessel physiology lecture and start our lecture on the blood. Uh, and then our last lecture will be on Thursday. As I also mentioned on Thursday, uh, we should have time for a question and answer review. Uh, any questions about the lab and lecture exam uh, will be accepted. As I mentioned, uh, the goal of this isn't for me to tell you what I think is important. That is what I do every day in class. This is for you to ask me questions about the things that you are not clear about. And uh, we'll see if we can come up with the answers. And remember, as I mentioned, if you don't ask questions on Thursday, then I assume you've mastered all of the material and I make the test harder. Excellent. We do have three assignments due on Thursday. Your 19 review, uh, your last Physio X, just exercise 11, activity four. Uh, and uh, Lapster uh, Hematology. And again, remember for full credit, you must do it 100% uh, complete and get 80% correct. Speaking of the Physio Xs, uh, there was a problem on this last Physio X. Uh, since they've gone to the HTML, this is a new uh, format this year. This hasn't been a problem in the past, but apparently there was a problem with Exercise 5.5. As uh, most of you guys figured out. However, I sent out an email about this this weekend and I still got several comments and questions and concerns about that after that. So that tells me one of two things are happening and I'm not sure which one I like least. Either you are ignoring my emails, which is a very, very bad thing to do, or you're not getting my emails, which is also very, very bad. If you did not receive that email from me, uh, then you need to check how you have your email set up in eServices. Uh, through uh, our uh, official enrollment for the class, I have a way to contact the class uh, where I can send uh, you know, basically a bulk email to everybody in the class. And it is one of the common ways that I will contact you. I do use the announcement board on Canvas, but for things that have a little bit more information on them, I often will send that email. And so if you're not receiving those emails, you could be missing out on important information, uh, changes in dates, problems with assignments like this one here, uh, where you then spend an hour trying to figure it out after it's already been figured, determined that there's a problem with it. And so it is important to make sure that uh, you are getting those emails. So please check that to make sure that you got that. Uh, and, uh, and if you did get it and ignored it, then uh, shame on you. Um, all leading up to Tuesdays, one week from today is your lab and lecture exam. Again, you will be using the Proctoria protocols uh, with your uh, cameras and microphones and everything that went along with that that you did on the Proctorio quiz. So that should be pretty simple and straightforward. And again, uh, the real key is you have to complete those exams during the class time. The other important thing is to be here on Thursday the 17th after the exam. It is always important to be here, but it is especially important to be here on that day. Because on that day after the lecture, you will be forming groups. Uh, you'll be selecting topics for your 50 point presentations. And uh, that is all gonna be done during class time. If you are not here on Thursday, you are not gonna be in a group. If you are not in a group, you are not getting a topic. And if you're not getting a topic, you're getting a zero on this 50 point assignment. So it is super important to make sure that you are going to be there on that day. If there's something that comes up or, or you already know you're not going to be here on that day, you need to let me know immediately. Otherwise, this is going to be a huge assignment that you're going to get a big fat zero on, which is a bad thing. So make sure you are here on Thursday to participate on that and discuss that concept. All right. Those are the t one of the two comments I wanted to ask. Uh, any other questions or any other concerns or anything else before we get started? I have a question. Yes. About the, today's quiz, how okay. can you see it again? What the mistakes were? Uh, so for any of the daily quizzes, because I reuse these questions, uh, what you can do is you can come to my office hours. I'm there the hour before class and we can go over a quiz and you can see uh, what you got right and what you got wrong on something like that. But I don't release the, uh, the, the quiz questions after the, the quiz. Okay. okay. All right, any other questions? All righty, let's go ahead and get started then. So, we left off last class and we talked about blood pressure. We talked about how you would measure blood pressure. We talked about some of the numbers associated with blood pressure. So what we need to talk about now is how we maintain blood pressure. Right, how it is, because we talked about blood pressure determines the movement of the blood in the body. 
So it is vitally, vitally important that we be able to regulate it and maintain it and modify it as necessary. Now, as we talked about in the last part, the three main factors that influence the blood pressure is cardiac output. And someone remind me again how we calculate cardiac output. Uh, isn't it stroke volume times the heart rate? Exactly, exactly. It is stroke volume uh, times the heart rate. Oops, why is that not writing? There we go. Stroke volume times the heart rate. Excellent. And I don't want that to be green, so I'll change that. Excellent. So absolutely. So that is how we would calculate that. Perfect. Hold on, keep this window up and move out of my way. Perfect. Excellent. Peripheral resistance. Remember the peripheral resistance as we talked about is the friction essentially in the blood vessels of the blood going against it. So as we talked about the viscosity of the blood affects that, the distance the blood has to travel affects that, uh, and the most dynamic and easiest way to change that peripheral resistance is by changing the diameter of the blood vessel. Because if you think about it, as you change the diameter of the blood vessel, you basically change the surface to volume ratio of that blood that is inside of it. So a smaller vessel blood, a smaller a size blood vessel is gonna have more surface area in relation to the volume of blood and it's gonna have more resistance. And then also, as we talked about, blood volume directly affects that as well. Uh, again, uh, if we want to calculate blood pressure, blood pressure would be calculated as the cardiac output times the peripheral resistance. And blood pressure varies directly with our cardiac output, uh, with our peripheral resistance, and with blood volume. Right. So again, as these things change, if our blood volume were to double, what would happen to our blood pressure? If these vary directly. It would double. It would double, excellent. If our cardiac output doubled, what would happen to blood pressure? Double. Double. And if our peripheral resistance doubled, what would happen to blood pressure? Double. Yeah, see how easy that is? Excellent. All right, oops. So. Things that can affect our cardiac output, things that affect our peripheral resistance, things that are affect our blood volume are things that are gonna affect our blood pressure. Now, as I mentioned, we want to monitor this constantly and maintaining blood pressure is a vitally important function. So not surprisingly, it is way down deep in the brain stem of the medulla oblongata where we have the nuclei that are responsible for controlling that. And uh, remind me again, what branches of the nervous system are involved in this? The sympathetic. Sympathetic, and what else? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. Oops. <clears throat> now, what does the sympathetic control exactly? What things does the parasympathetic, pardon me, does the sympathetic nervous system control that would affect blood pressure? Uh, the muscles. Uh, okay, but be more specific. What, what do you mean by muscles? You're right, but what muscles? The tunica media. Okay, excellent. So it connects, uh, it controls the tunica uh, media of the blood vessels. That of course uh, controls the uh, radius of them, the diameter of them. And that is going to, oops, diameter, there we go. Uh, which is gonna affect blood pressure. Does it control anything else? Heart rate. Yeah, there you go. It is gonna control heart rate. How does it control the heart rate? Increases. True, you're correct. It is going to increase the heart rate more so that exactly. Specifically, it increases the heart rate. How does it increase the heart rate? Send signals to the AV node. And? The Grace force of contraction. Bundle. Close, the AV node and what other node? SA, SA node. node. Yeah. So, there you go. And ventricles. Well, we'll get to that, the SA node. Uh, and the AV node, but you are absolutely correct, and that would increase the heart rate, make it beat faster. That, of course, 
would increase our cardiac output, which would affect blood pressure. But you are also correct in that our sympathetic nervous system innervates those Purkinje fibers of the ventricles. And by innervating the Purkinje fibers of the ventricles, what effect does it have on the heart? My contraction. Increases the force of contraction. Excellent. It increases the force of contraction. And if we are increasing the force of contraction, then if you think about that, that is going to uh, decrease our end systolic volume. And if we decrease our end systolic volume, that is going to increase our stroke volume. And if we increase our stroke volume, then that of course is going to increase our blood pressure. All right, so notice these are all three ways that our sympathetic nervous system is capable of influencing a blood pressure directly by changing the diameter of the blood vessels. Uh, directly by changing the stroke volume, how much blood we're putting out and affecting that cardiac output, and also directly by increasing the heart rate. Now, what about the parasympathetic? Does it do all the same things? No. No, what does it do? It innervates SA node. Excellent. It innervates uh, the SA node and the AV nodes only, All right? And that allows it to control heart rate. And as you guys pointed out, what type of effect in particular would it have on the heart rate? Decreases. Right, it would decrease. And of course, if it decreases heart rate, that decreases our cardiac output. And if it decreases our cardiac output, that is going to lower our blood pressure as well. So notice both our sympathetic and parasympathetic have the ability to influence blood pressure, but which of the two have the much more dramatic control of blood pressure? Sympathetic. Sympathetic. Sympathetic has much more direct control of that blood pressure in that fashion. All right. Excellent. All right. Everybody got that so I can erase it and we can make room for more stuff. Okay. Perfect. All right, but remember neural control is not the only thing that is going to be able to influence it. And to influence it, we have to have, uh, uh, again, that homeostatic uh, process that we talked about, that homeostatic negative feedback and positive feedback loop. And for that, we need components. We need uh, receptors that receive the information and send the information to the command center. Uh, and there are two primary types of uh, stimulators or receptors, I should say more specifically, uh, that receive the information that allow us to regulate blood pressure. And these are chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. The chemical composition of the blood, things like oxygen levels, uh, CO2 levels, uh, and even things like potassium and things along those lines have the ability to affect and influence our blood pressure, how much blood pressure we have there. But one of the primary ways we regulate our blood pressure directly is with the use of baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are basically stretch receptors. We've talked about this before already in the class. Stretch receptors uh, send a continuous Uh, action potentials to the central nervous system, but the rate varies based on uh, their stretch. So the rate varies based on their stretch. When the stretch goes up, and let's spread this out a little bit so I have a little bit more room to write. An increased stretch. And that increased stretch would be in response to what type of a change in blood pressure? Increase. All right. So if blood pressure increases, 
that causes the baroreceptor to stretch more and the rate, the AP firing rate increases. Conversely, if there's a decreased stretch, that would of course indicate that blood pressure decreased and the action potential firing rate would decrease. Let's see how this would work. Let's actually figure out and do our homeostatic chart the way we did back in 430. Of course, step one is there is a disturbance. What do you like? Increase in blood pressure, decrease in blood pressure? Someone pick one. Increase. Increase, excellent. So the, the disturbance is an increase in blood pressure. Excellent, all right. So that is our disturbance. There's an increase in blood pressure. Of course, if we are going to be able to respond to that, we have must have some type of receptor. And that receptor is able to perceive the information. And as we just mentioned, these uh, receptors in this case is going to be that baroreceptor. Whoops, did I spell it right? Baroreceptors. Now, baroreceptors can be found throughout blood vessels in the body, but there are two places in particular, main locations uh, where these uh, baroreceptors are going to be found. The first is a cluster of chemo and baroreceptors in the aortic arch known as the aortic bodies. So these aortic bodies uh, basically are located in the aortic arch. And basically are monitoring the blood pressure and the chemical composition of blood that is basically being spent th throughout the body. The second main location for these baroreceptors is in the carotid bodies. The carotid bodies are an enlargement uh, that is found where the common carotid splits. And when the common carotid artery splits, where does it go again? What does it split and become? External and internal uh, carotid. There you go. External, which goes to the outer surface superficial structures, and the internal carotid, which goes up to my brain. Is it pretty important to know the blood pressure and the chemical composition of the blood going to my brain? Yeah, probably yes. pretty darn important. Excellent. So here we have these receptors, these baroreceptors in these location that is going to be receiving this information. All right. Now, as we mentioned, when there's an increase in blood pressure, as we talked about, so let's go ahead and write this here. The blood vessel stretches. And when the blood vessel stretches, what happens to the firing rate of my baroreceptors? Increase. Yeah, we get an increase in firing rate of the baroreceptors. This is going to then send information to our command center. Oops. Our command center in this case is going to be those nuclei in the medulla oblongata uh, that control uh, the uh, heart. Excellent. In this case, with this particular stimulus, we get an increase in firing rate from the baroreceptors. So again, the job of our control center, our command center is to process the information. All right, increase BP bad and bring it down. So it is then going to send information out to our effectors.
right? And these effectors are what uh, influence the change. All right, so what are our effectors going to be in this case? All right, smooth muscle where? In the tunica media. In uh, systemic blood vessels, arteries. Excellent, oops. Excellent, so smooth muscle and systemic arteries in the tunica media, excellent. Anything else? The uh, SA and AV nodes to there tell them they're well, going back. Or let's even, we can even abbreviate that heart. Right, so we're gonna do the smooth muscle right. and more specifically, right, in the heart, it is the cardiac muscle. All right, so the cardiac muscle of the heart. So actually, let's be consistent. Cardiac muscle of the heart. Excellent, but you are also right, the SA node, uh, the AV node, and potentially the ventricles. All right, excellent. So in this case, we have to send a signal. Let's start easy. We need to send a signal to the smooth muscle of the systemic arteries. What would the pathway for that be? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Right, if we're going to the smooth muscle of the arteries, it has to be sympathetic. And what are we gonna to wanna to do with our sympathetic nervous system? Are we gonna increase firing rate or decrease firing rate? Increase the firing rate. Increase, because, well, when we, remember, when we increase firing rate, that is gonna cause the muscle to contract. Do we want the muscle, the, the smooth muscle of the systemic arteries to contract, or do we want it to relax? Relax. Oh, to relax. So we're going to decrease firing rate. And when we decrease the firing rate, you're absolutely correct. What's going to happen as a result of that is that our blood vessel uh, dilates. And when it dilates, what happens to the blood pressure? Decreases. Decreases and hopefully brings it back into balance. So let's actually cheat and move this one to the inside too, so it's out of the way. And then we can also talk about, also at the same time, let's go ahead and change colors to make this easier. We're gonna to wanna to send a signal to the heart. What kind of signal are we gonna to wanna to send to the heart? What pathway? What, what type of information do we want to send to the heart? Well, let's think of it this way. What do we want to do? If it's easier, we can think about what do we want to actually do to the heart in this case. In this case, our goal is to decrease blood pressure. So to decrease blood pressure, we have to decrease heart rate. And we need to uh, decrease the force of the uh, pumping of the ventricles, contraction. So how can we do that? Excellent, so we can do it two ways. We can increase our parasympathetic output that would lower the heart rate But at the same time, we want to decrease our sympathetic output because that is going to both lower the heart rate and it's going to reduce the force and the contraction. All of which will bring the blood pressure down. So notice in this fashion, I'm not sure what that music is. I'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody, but please feel free to turn it back on if you need to ask questions.
In this way, we have now described that homeostatic feedback, right, that first big physiological concept we talked about in 430, and use that information to see how this barrow reflex would work, right? And not surprisingly, if we go back to the lecture, we see it works in the exact same way. Notice again, the example we just used, where there is an increase in pressure, the baroreceptor, this one here in the carotid bodies, right, where the common carotid branches to the internal and the external, uh, that sends a signal to the brain, the brain sends a signal to the heart to dilate the blood vessels, because when the, when the radius increases, pressure goes down and causes the heart to uh, both pump less uh, hard and also to uh, decrease the heart rate, bring it back in balance. And conversely, the opposite is true. If the blood pressure is not high enough, we increase heart rate, constricting the blood vessels, bringing the pressure up, make the heart beat faster, make the heart beat stronger. And notice, sympathetic is gonna be the primary way we do that because it controls the blood vessels, it controls both the heart rate and the force of the contraction as well. All right, but again, our parasympathetic can play a role in it as well. Remember, we always have that autonomic tone, right? There's always sympathetic and parasympathetic input. They're not always gonna be equal, right? But there is gonna always be input from both into structures that have dual innervation. All right, questions on that? I have a question. Can we just get away with saying that the, like the sympathetic goes down and the parasympathetic doesn't go up? Like, do we have to mention the parasympathetic? If you were specifically talking about the baroreceptor reflex, I would allow you to focus on the sympathetic, yes. Okay. Yeah. Because it ticks all the boxes involved the smooth muscle in the blood vessels, the uh, contraction rate, as well as the force of the contraction. So yes, if you left that out, I probably would allow that. Not probably, I'd allow that. All right, great question, any others? All right, as we've also talked about, uh, nervous system is not the only way we can control and regulate our blood pressure. Hormones can do it as well. So let's talk about some examples of this. Starting first with the easy one we've all known and talked about a lot, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And remind me again, what are the other names for epinephrine and norepinephrine? Adrenaline and noradrenaline. Yeah, adrenaline and noradrenaline, absolutely, right? As anybody who has ever been scared knows, that adrenaline uh, that epinephrine and norepinephrine increases heart rate, increases the force of contraction, making a heartbeat stronger and faster in our chest, right? And as we also talked about, it leads to both vasoconstriction and vasodilation. How can it do both? So it just has the, all the blood vessels bouncing back and forth between contraction and dilation. Is that what all our blood vessels do in response to that stress response? No. No, so how is it different? Different effects, excellent, on different parts of the body. What regions of the body do we want to constrict the blood vessels to, limiting blood flow to those areas? The digestive system. Excellent, Peripheral. digestive system, where else? Peripheral, like arms and legs. Yes, yeah, skin, right? Basically non-essential stuff, exactly. Whereas where do we want to dilate blood vessels to? The heart, muscles, and lungs. Heart, muscles, lungs. Uh, heart, muscles, lungs, I heard. Lungs. I can think of two other good places. Brain. Brain, see, brain is one of those tricky ones. When you're in that fight or flight situation, is that typically when you make your best decisions? Well. It's when you yeah. should. <laughs> no, it's, well, no, not really. If you think about it, you got to, again, you got to think of this from an evolutionary standpoint. From an evolutionary standpoint, stress was typically associated with you being about to die, right? Bears with axes roamed the countryside, and when you came across a bear with the axe, you basically had two choices. 
those two choices were to either fight that bear with an axe or outrun somebody in the class, right? <laughs> there aren't big complicated decisions that need to be made at that point. Typically when we're in a stressful situation, there isn't an increased blood flow to the brain. Now, yes, I know everybody says, no, I work great under stress. I write the best papers, right? When it's half an hour before it's due and all, that's when my creative juices are flowing. All of that is complete BS. If you actually put the time and effort in that paper, that paper is always gonna be better if you put more time and effort to it and then if you're rushing at the end when you're stressed. When you are stressed, there is not an increase in blood flow to your brain, right? If anything, we don't wanna decrease it, because again, our brain is not uh, the type of tissue that uh, can regenerate easily. So we don't wanna decrease blood flow to it, but we don't increase blood flow to it as well. So for the most part, the blood vessels to the brain are pretty much non-responsive to epinephrine and norepinephrine because we don't, we don't need to make big complicated decisions or at least evolutionarily, we didn't need to make big confident decisions when we were uh, scared when we were fighting or running for our lives. What we did need to do is send blood to our muscles, send blood to our lungs, send blood to our heart. And what's the other two things we're going to need to do if we're going to need to fight or if we're going to need to um, outrun somebody in the class? Adrenal glands? Well, adrenaline remembers what's causing this change. Right? If you think about it, right, as it should be late at night, you should be up every night late at night studying for this class, especially since we don't start till noon. Right? You can stay up late and you can study because that's when the kids are asleep. That's when your loved ones are asleep. It's quiet. You can be very, very productive in that situation. And then bang, there's a, a huge massive noise outside, right? And it scares the bejesus out of you. And it takes you about three seconds to realize it's just the neighbor's car backfiring. But does your heart rate instantly go back to normal once you know you're safe? No. No, because that adrenaline keeps it elevated for a prolonged period of time, right? So heart, muscle, lung, what else do we need if we're going to be physically responding to a stress? Well, let's see. Why do we go to the lungs? To get more oxygen. What do we need that oxygen to do? Get to your muscles. Why? Why do the muscles need oxygen? So they can, you can operate run. better. Okay, so that they can operate. How do they operate? What is it that they use that oxygen for? Contraction. Okay, how? How is that oxygen helping the contraction? With ATP and in, in the sarcoma. And ATP, it allows, yes. Oxygen allows us to efficiently make ATP out of what? Proteins. Is it Glucose. proteins that we break down? Glucose. Glucose. There you go. Excellent. Glucose. So we need fuel. We, if we're going to be physically active, we need fuel. So the other place where blood vessels dilate is to the liver and to the adipose tissue. Because when we are stressed, our body knows that if we're stressed, we have to respond physically. So we need to get that oxygen ready. We get to get that fuel ready, get it going to the, the muscles so that we can deal with that stress. And that's the huge problem with stress because the things that used to stress us out were bears with axes. They, again, they roamed the countryside in hordes, right? We had to fight for our lives. Nowadays, it's that test you have in a week or that 10 page paper you have due on Thursday. And now when you're stressed by things, what you do is you stare at a book or you type on a keyboard for 15 hours, right? What happens is you mobilize all these resources in your body and then you don't use them, right? Stress is horrible. I was glorious before I had kids. I didn't have the spare tire, I had hair, right? I, I was glorious, right? But that stress of having children and everything else that goes along with it, right? Makes me look like this now. So again, you gotta remember from an evolutionary standpoint, stress equaled energy. And so that's where these things are dilating to, to go in those cases. All right. Now, if you think about it, we have this vasoconstriction and vasodilation, but there is more of the constriction than there is of dilation. And so overall, what effect does this have on the blood pressure? Increases. It's going to increase blood pressure. Absolutely. All right. Uh, way back in the way, uh, Radhika asked the picture uh, about the, the, the drawing that I did. Yeah, I can post that. Actually, let me go back and save that now before I forget. 
because we'll come back to it and I'll delete it. And uh, so I'll go ahead and save that. And so I can, yeah, I can, I can post that on the website. All right. So I think, again, the stress response is something that most of us are pretty comfortable and familiar with. Um, this one's a little trickier. We are going to just do the basics of this for right now. We are going to talk about this pathway in much more detail when we get to the urinary system. Yes, great question. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are almost identical chemicals. Um, there are some minor differences in them and there are some minor differences on their effect in the body. But for our purposes in this class, because the sky is blue in this class, uh, they're completely interchangeable chemically for us. Norepinephrine is the one that is primarily used locally as the neurotransmitter that our sympathetic nervous system releases, whereas epinephrine, about 80% of what is released from our adrenal gland is epinephrine and only about 20% is norepinephrine. So the epinephrine tends to be more systemic where the norepinephrine tends to be more local in its use. But the way they bind to the receptors and influence the effectors is essentially identical. And for us, it is identical. All right, great question. Any others on adrenaline and the need for speed before we move on from that? All right. So as I mentioned, this renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway is something we will talk about in more detail when we get to the urinary system. But here is the short version of this. Uh, when there is a drop in blood pressure, oops, wrong button, need that. When there is a drop in blood pressure, uh, this is noted in the kidney. Right? As we have talked about before, while you're sitting here at rest, about 25% of your blood is being directed to your kidneys. All right, so your kidneys are receiving about 25% of your blood while you're sitting here resting calmly. So your kidneys do a very important role in not just filtering the blood, but also monitoring the condition of the blood as well. If the blood pressure in the kidney drops, then what happens is the kidney then releases a protein-like hormone. Chemically, it is not a hormone, but it acts very much like a hormone. And that protein-like hormone is renin. Renin leads to the activation of a, uh, of a, of a, of a hormone called angiotensin. In fact, it causes angiotensin 1 to be converted into angiotensin 2. Uh, angiotensin 1 is made in the liver, but it is activated by an enzyme in the lungs. Again, it's this elaborate pathway we will talk about uh, when we get to the urinary system. And between angiotensin 2 and aldosterone, basically what it does is it targets the kidney. So notice the stimulus occurred in the kidney, but it also targets the kidney. And the short version of this that we need to know right now is it targets the kidney and tells the kidney to hold on to oxygen and to bring sodium back into the blood. As I think I've already mentioned in this class, your kidney produces 200 liters of filtrate during the course of the day. Notice I said, didn't say 200 liters of urine. Right? Nobody hopefully produces 200 liters of urine. If you are, you're sitting in the bathroom right now listening to this lecture. Right? And more importantly, you don't have 200 liters of uh, excess fluid in your body that you can get rid of. But it produces 200 liters of filtrate and over 99% of that is reabsorbed. During that reabsorption process, the body brings back things that it wants. So what angiotensin II and aldosterone tell the kidney to do is, hey, that water, bring that water back into the blood. And if you bring more water back into the blood, what happens to your blood volume? It increases. It increases. And if blood volume increases, what happens to blood pressure? It increases. It increases as well. Excellent. It also tells the kidney to grab that sodium, that most common of extracellular cations, and to bring it back into the blood. And if you're bringing a whole bunch of sodium back into the blood, what's gonna follow that sodium? Water. 
water. Water likes to follow stuff. So if you start bringing back a whole bunch of stuff, then water is going to be coming back as well, which of course increases our blood volume and increases our blood pressure. So notice both directly by bringing back water and indirectly by bringing back sodium, which brings back water, it increases our blood volume, which is going to increase our blood pressure. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. All of these are super good, super important for uh, getting that uh, blood pressure back up. Antidiuretic hormone is another hormone, also sometimes occurred, referred to as vasopressin. Antidiuretic hormone is released by your pituitary gland. We'll talk about that a lot in the next section when we talk about the endocrine system. And what does antidiuretic hormone do? Prevents you from losing water. Yeah, exactly. It's the opposite of a diuretic, right? It's an antidiuretic. A diuretic makes you flush water out of your system. This tells you to hold on to water. So again, it does two things. It tells us our kidneys, right? Targets the kidneys. It also targets the kidneys. To bring back water, which increases blood uh, volume, which increases blood pressure. In fact, this antidiuretic hormone is one of the main ways that we concentrate our urine, right? When we are slightly dehydrated as a result, making your urine smaller volume and darker and yellow in color as a result of that. It also causes vasoconstriction, which again increases blood pressure as well. You may not have thought of antidiuretic hormone in this way, but I know you're aware of it because there are two things that many of you are familiar with uh, that affect your production and release of antidiuretic hormone. One of the things that uh, decreases the production and the release of antidiuretic hormone is caffeine. Mm -hmm. So you have that nice big quad shot from Dutch Brothers on your way to school in the morning, again, back in ancient times when we had schools, right? And as a result of that, an hour into class, you've got to pee really, really badly. And when else do you have to pee really, really badly? Alcohol. There you go. On the bar on Friday night, after your fourth Long Island iced tea, you really, really have to pee, right? And you know, once you break that seal, you're just going all night long, right? Because again, and that dehydration from that is actually one of the main factors that leads to uh, the hangover that you get the next morning. All right. So there you go. All of these, as you can see, and then again, don't even get me started on those four locos, right? The caffeine and the alcohol, those are trouble. Excellent. All right. Now, all of that being said, obviously you can tell with all these different hormonal um, uh, pathways that bringing blood pressure up, maintaining that high blood pressure is important for maintaining the flow of the blood because it is those pressure changes that pressure gradient that allows the blood to flow properly through your body. And what did we say the high point of that was? What's the highest pressure typically associated with our cardiovascular system? The aorta. In the aorta, when it's first getting pumped out of the ventricle at about 120 millimeters of mercury. Uh, same thing that happens with that four loco, then you really have to pee, right? And again, coffee and wine, are you mixing them together? That one's scary. Ew. I know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, although, I, look, I, I have no problem with Irishing up your coffee. I do that every morning before lecture. Right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, again, same thing. Both of those are going to suppress antidiuretic hormone, either production or release. And so as a result of that, uh, yeah, you are going to be holding back less water. More water is part of your urine. It makes your urine more dilute and it increases the volume of your urine, which means you typically have to go to the restroom more frequently and you get dehydrated as a result. All right, excellent. High pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury. And what did we say the pressure should be when it comes back into the right atrium? Zero. Zero millimeters of mercury. What happens if it's not zero millimeters of mercury. Is that necessarily going to be a good thing? No. No, 
right? We want it to be zero. If the pressure coming back into that right atrium is too high, then what happens is that volume and that pressure causes the atria to stretch. And when the atria stretches from an increase in pressure, the atria of the heart is actually able to produce its own hormone. And the hormone it produces is atrial natriuretic peptide. And what atrial natriuretic peptide does is not surprisingly, it targets the kidney and it tells the kidney, hey, stop bringing back so much water. Let more of the water leave in the urine. And it says, stop bringing back so much sodium. Let sodium leave in the urine. And of course, if sodium leaves into the urine, what's gonna follow that sodium? Water. Water. So notice in this case, we target the kidney and this atrial natriuretic peptide actually will allow us to lower our blood pressure if it is too high. All right. Great question. How does it enter the atria if the pressure is zero? Because the pressure in the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava is two. And if you have a pressure gradient between two millimeters of mercury and zero millimeters of mercury, blood doesn't want to be at the higher pressure. Blood is always going to go to the lower pressure location. Of course, then you tell me, but as soon as the blood enters in there, the pressure isn't going to be zero anymore because blood fills the atria. But remember, blood doesn't really fill the atria because when the heart is at rest, the atrioventricular valves are open and that blood pretty much pours right into the ventricle. And so the blood pressure of the atria essentially stays zero. That's basically uh, the passive filling, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's the passive filling of the ventricles. That's exactly how that happens. All right, excellent. Great questions, comments, any others? Perfect, so we have talked hormonal control, we have talked neural control, here's the pretty picture from your textbook, that flow chart that kind of puts it all together. All right, excellent. It is a teeny bit early, but I think this is a good natural stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our first break here. Uh, we'll take a 15 minute break, come back at uh, we'll call it 113, and at 113, we will pick up from here. Any questions before we uh, take our break? Where can we find the actual recordings of the lecture videos? Uh, the, I have a YouTube channel, uh, so you can go onto YouTube and just do a search for Daniel Slutsky. I can't imagine there's too many of those. But uh, more importantly, if you go into the modules, under the study tools, there is a direct link to my YouTube page, and that is where all of the videos are posted. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? All right. I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Any questions before we get rolling again? All right. So, as before, we've talked about. Uh, maintaining homeostasis, but obviously with something as dynamic as blood pressure, uh, there are issues in maintaining uh, homeostasis. And so let's talk about some examples of that. Now let's talk first about hypertension. A hypertension it can be transient or it can be persistent, which of course means it can either be something that happens very briefly or something that occurs over a prolonged period of time. When talking about hypertension, and primarily when diagnosing it, uh, it is important to distinguish between what we call primary or essential hypertension and what we call secondary hypertension. What is the difference between primary hypertension and secondary hypertension? Secondary is when the hypertension is caused by something else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good way of, uh, of describing it. Uh, primary hypertension, the problem is having high blood pressure. And there are lots of factors that can influence that. Things like diet, uh, your weight, your age, your race, hereditary stress, smoking, all of those types of things. 
Now, obviously, you can change your weight, you can change your smoking. It's kind of harder to change your age, race, and heredity. Uh, but those other factors can uh, be influenced. And so we target those types of behaviors to tr in hopes of bringing primary hypertension down. All right? You can stop smoking all you want, uh, but your hypertension isn't going to go away if it is a secondary hypertension uh, due to, for instance, an endocrine disorder or producing excessive renin in your kidneys or hardening of the blood vessels and the arteriosclerosis or something along those lines. So in the case with secondary hypertension, to get that blood pressure to get back down, you basically need to resolve whatever the primary disorder is. And once you resolve that primary disorder, then um, what should happen is that the blood pressure should come down as a result of that. So yeah, so again, from a... Um, Effect of blood, you know, effect of that high blood pressure on the heart and all the other factors we talked about. It doesn't really matter whether it's primary or secondary. Whether it's primary or secondary primarily matters if it is uh, for the treatment of it. I guess would be the, the best way to describe that. Hypotension can also be a concern as well. And again, there are different types of hypotension. We already talked about one example, and that one example was the orthostatic hypotension. Uh, this is where you get a temporary drop in blood pressure and dizziness when suddenly changing position. So if you're laying down or reclining and then you suddenly sit up or you suddenly stand up, that change in position uh, causes us to get a little dizzy. And as we talked about prior, the reason for this is, again, the goal of your cardiovascular system is to maximize the efficiency. When you are laying down uh, horizontally, the heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump the blood to all parts of your body, especially to your head. So it pumps slower and it pumps uh, weaker as a result of that. Yes, in extreme cases, you can absolutely poop, pass out from that, Jessica, absolutely. Um, so when you suddenly instantly stand up, Right, you can get dizzy as a result of that because it takes a second for the heart to realize that it has to work harder to get the blood up to your head. And so you can get that dizziness as a result of it. And yeah, in extreme cases, uh, it can cause someone to pass out. Normally someone just gets dizzy, uh, may lose their balance or something like that. But technically it's possible to pass out as a result of that. Uh, again, obviously orthostatic hypotension is a very transient uh, condition, whereas something like a chronic hypotension uh, could be an indication of some other type of underlying disorder, something like, for instance, Addison's disease. Addison's disease is a condition where there's a decrease in the hormones that are produced uh, from your adrenal gland, like that aldosterone we talked about or some other ones. Uh, could be an indication of poor nutrition, things along those lines as well. Uh, often acute hypotension uh, can be an important sign of uh, circulatory shock, where suddenly there is an instant drop in blood uh, pressure. One of the places where this can be really, really important, uh, could it be deadly? No, probably not deadly, uh, the orthostatic. I mean, I, I guess <laughs> if you fall and hit your head on something, right, or fall off of a building or something along those lines. So I guess maybe secondarily it could be, but the, the point of passing out when people pass out is when you pass out, you typically fall and become horizontal. And when you fall and become horizontal, it makes it easier for your heart to get blood to your brain. And so as a result of it, it's typically acute enough where, uh, where while you may lose consciousness, you're not going to, to occur any damage other than the damage that occurs from the fall. Acute hypotension is something that is especially important in uh, individuals who are recovering from surgery. So this is something that is watched very, very closely uh, in the ICU or postoperatively after someone has had surgery, because if there is a dramatic drop in blood pressure, uh, that could be a strong indication of, um, of internal bleeding. Right. Obviously, if, some, if a bear comes and takes a big, huge chunk out of your shoulder, that can cause hypotension as well. But when you're gushing blood out of your shoulder, pretty, but people pretty much have a good idea why you're losing blood and why you're losing blood pressure. If you're recovering from in that surgical suite afterwards and suddenly there's a rapid drop in blood pressure, but there's no external sign of blood, then obviously that could be an indication of internal bleeding that is taking place and can be a concern that way as well. I wouldn't say that 
others don't have orthostatic, uh, orthostatic hypotension, I would say that maybe some people are more sensitive to it than others. Uh, that could be what their uh, normal starting heart rate is, or I mean, blood pressure is, or things along those lines. Uh, there are other factors, um, the same way that some people get basal vagal reflexes, uh, which can cause them to pass out when you know they're dealing with things that are stressful or, 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 or things along those lines. Uh, they can get, uh, uh, inappropriate activation, so an increased activation of the parasympathetic nervous system that can cause things like that to occur. So I wouldn't say that there are people who are insensitive to it, but there are definitely people that are that are more sensitive to it than others, probably. All righty. Now, again, those are the different types of hypotension, and as we talked about a little bit kind of bit before, we have this issue of cardiovascular shock. Cardiovascular shock is basically the condition where it is the failure of the cardiovascular system to de deliver enough oxygen and nutrients, right? And as we've talked about, there can be different causes for this. Essentially, we are not able to get enough blood to an area. Uh, one of the simplest examples that we talked about early on is if there's a problem with the SA node. As we talked about, uh, so again, acute hypotension would also be what occurs when you stab a victim absolutely and with a sharp object and they're, they're bleeding out as a result of that. But as I mentioned, with that type of acute hypotension, the cause is obvious, right? When the bear takes a big chunk out of your arm, the cause of that hypotension is obvious. When, when it's internal bleeding, it's not as obvious. And so that's why, like I said, it, from a clinical standpoint, it's more important to watch it that way. Um, both, it can be both, absolutely. And again, uh, the acute hypotension leads to hypovolumetric shock. That's kind of the point we're getting to here, absolutely. These changes in blood flow or changes in blood volume lead to a failure of the cardiovascular system to deliver enough oxygen and nutrients, and that is what we call cardiovascular shock, right? Where you're not able to get enough oxygen and nutrients to an area where you get inadequate perfusion, right? Uh, again, the problem with that is you get less oxygen to the area, so that those cells have to rely more on a rat or a anaerobic respiration. And if it has to deal with anaerobic respiration, you get an increase in lactic acid. And that lactic acid can be toxic to cells, it changes the pH of the cells and so it changes its function. This can damage the cell or even in extreme cases lead to cell death. And of course that cell death in extreme cases can lead to organ failure and even ultimately death as a result of that. So you were right, different types of hypotension can lead to different types of shock. Like you just mentioned, hypovolumetric shock. This is a loss of blood volume, right? Where we're hemorrhaging uh, blood internally or externally, right? Again, those are the more obvious ones, but also uh, extreme water loss can also occur with severe diarrhea or with other flu-like symptoms. If you're vomiting a lot, if you're having severe di diarrhea, things like that can also cause someone to be highly dehydrated. And that extreme dehydration leads to a decrease in blood volume, uh, which leads to that hypovolumetric shock, hypo, pardon me, hypovolemic shock. Cardiogenic shock, we talked about before when we were talking about the heart, is that damage to the pump and the heart. And we talked about the two different types of that uh, that can occur where we have the, that, uh, that failure of one side of the heart to pump versus the other side of the pump. And we saw that congestion that occurred because of that uh, decrease in it. We also talked about vascular shock as well. This is when we get that inappropriate vasodilation uh, from things like an allergic reaction. That anaphylactic shock is an example of a rapid dilation of blood vessels. Vascular shock is also what happens in the vasal vagal reflex. In the vasal vagal reflex, what happens is someone, uh, because of stress or anxiety or something along those lines, gets an increase in um, a parasympathetic output, which suppresses the sympathetic nervous system. We get the heart beating much slower uh, as a result of that, and a dilation of the blood vessels that occurs and causes that person to lose um, uh, consciousness as a result and can pass out from that. And then things like a pulmonary embolism where we get an obstructive shock. In this case, the heart is fine, the blood vessels are fine, uh, but maybe a plaque or something like that breaks off uh, and blocks a blood vessel. And as a result of that, we cannot get uh, blood to perfuse that area as a result of that blockage. 
And when that occurs, uh, that we call that an obstructive shock. All right, questions on that? How does sepsis lead to shock? Um, well, so you so neurogenic would be another example of like the vasovagal, typically leading to a vascular shock that would typically occur. That's typically how that occur. I'm not a, I'm not certain how sepsis leads to shock. I don't have an answer for that. I'm not familiar enough with sepsis. Sorry, I can't answer that. Maybe during the next break we'll look that up. Let me see if I write that down. All right. So I don't know the answer to that one, but I'll, we'll be able to figure it out. But uh, neurogenic primarily is a vascular, like the vasovagal reflux. All right, excellent. The last thing we need to talk about, a uh, big concept we need to talk about, uh, hold on. Okay, that's great. Like I said, I just, I'm not familiar enough with sepsis to know, but sure, that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, the. Right, so, but I could see where an infection could lead to maybe more blood loss, so hypovolumetric that way. I'm not sure why I would call the blood vessels to, uh, to dilate. Maybe it's more of an obstructive that way, but now again, like I said, I, I'm, I'm speculating. I don't, I don't know enough about sepsis to be able to answer that question. Like I said, I'll see if I can find it during the first, next break. All right, excellent. Last big concept, something that you can be fairly certain is going to be on the exam. We need to talk about the physiology of our capillaries. We talked about the anatomy of our capillaries, right? We know there are three main flavors of capillaries, the continuous, the fenestrated, and the sinusoid. Uh, but we also have talked about how the capillaries are the primary location where the exchange of materials take place. And as we also talked about in the last class, this process is completely passive. Right? That doesn't mean that there may not be some vascular transportation, things like that that goes on, but it is primarily a passive process. And as such, it is going to rely on pressures uh, for the movement of materials. And so we need to talk about those pressures that are gonna be involved in this process. All right, so again, this is a passive process, pressure gradients absolutely, as well as concentration gradients uh, that are going to rely on these things to cause them to go. So it's again, completely passive, it occurs via diffusion. All right, so it's movement of water and solutes driven by the pressure changes in relation to the capillaries and what's going on outside the capillaries, right, the interstitial fluid. So let's talk about this and let's actually do this this way first. Uh, let's go ahead and do it on the whiteboard first. So here, I don't want to do this. I'll do it down here. This will be fun. Nope, don't want that. Fuck. All right, here's my capillary. We know it's going to be fed into by an arteriole and fed out of into a venule. So let's label all of these. So this is my arterial over on this side. Move this down there. Move that down there, so it's out of my way. This is my venule here, and of course, this is my capillary in between. All right, excellent. And we know that this is going to contain inside of it blood. And blood 
is technically made out of water and stuff, right? Excellent. Well, and let's actually move that. This goes here to remind us that this is the capillary that is filled with water and stuff. So what is this out here? What is all of this that surrounds the capillary? Could be an organ. Right, it, it could be an organ or some, could be something. So basically what it is going to be is some type of tissue, right? There's gonna be some type of tissue that is going to surround that capillary. And of course, uh, that tissue is comprised of cells and what else? What is tissue, what are tissues comprised of? Cells and interstitial fluid, excellent. So here, we're gonna have interstitial fluid. And what is interstitial fluid made up of? Proteins. True. Nutrients. Water. How about water and stuff? Excellent. Both interstitial fluid and blood are made up of water and stuff. Excellent. All right. Now, with this being our environment, there are going to be basically four pressures that we are going to have to pay attention to. Now, blood is blood making it of water and stuff. And as we know, blood pushes on its boundaries. And as blood pushes on its boundaries, that blood produces a force. Right, the fluid of the blood pushes on the, on the, let's say it this way. I need to make this smaller. The fluid, oh, actually, that down here. Erase that there. The fluid of the blood pushes on the boundaries of the blood vessel. And what do we call that? What do we call that force of the blood pushing on its boundaries? Resistance. True, it, it, it is related to resistance. You guys are overthinking it. When blood pushes against its boundaries, what do we call that? Pressure. Blood pressure. It's the blood Forward. pressure, absolutely. Okay. Right? We have the blood pressure. Blood pressure is the force of the blood against its boundaries. And since it's mostly water, right, it's that blood pressure is the force of the really water against its boundaries. Of course, we give a fancy name to the force that blood makes when it pushes against its boundaries. And what is that? Osmotic pressure. When water pushes it against its boundaries, what is the term we use for that? Osmotic pressure. Not osmotic pressure. When water pushes against its boundaries, we call it hydrostatic pressure. So we have this hydrostatic pressure of the blood, which is essentially the blood pressure, all right? Water pushing against its boundaries. And I will tell you right now that uh, the is a capillary gradient. I don't know if anybody remember what we said it was, but the hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure in the uh, blood at the arterial end of the capillary is about 35 millimeters of mercury. Whereas at the venual end, the hydrostatic pressure of the blood is about 17 millimeters of mercury. And if you remember, we need this pressure gradient to get the blood to move from one side of the blood vessel to the other. All right, we comfortable with that so far? So we'll put that one there. We'll put this one here. Let's cheat, move this in a little bit more. Move this in a little bit more. Except for one more question. This blood 
is pushing against its boundaries, right? When it's pushing against the boundaries then, would this be a force that is trying to push water and stuff out of the capillary or trying to push water and stuff into the capillary? Into? Well, remember, it's pushing against its boundaries, and if that boundary is leaky, which way is the water and stuff going to go? Out. Out. Exactly. Right. So this hydrostatic pressure of the blood, or hydrostatic cap pressure of the capillary, as somebody pointed out, it could be the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary is fine as well. We consider this an outward force. Okay? Excellent. But... As we know, blood also has stuff in it. And as we know, water is attracted to stuff. It likes to go where stuff is. Okay? And if it likes to go where stuff is, what would we call that type of force? Where water likes to go, where the water follows stuff. Osmo osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure. Right. Absolutely. So we have the osmotic pressure of the blood. And remember, blood is a suspension. It's a colloid. So it's sometimes called the osmotic pressure of the blood colloid. We can just use osmotic pressure of the blood, where water is attracted to stuff. And if water is being drawn towards the stuff that is in the capillary, would you consider that an inward force or an outward force? Inward. Inward, absolutely. This would be an inward force where, oops, wrong color, I want blue, where water is being drawn into the capillary. All right, so far so good? Done silence. Excellent. That tells me, yes, I perfectly understand this. Excellent. Well, guess where else there's water and stuff? Interstitial fluid. In the interstitial fluid. So do we have a hydrostatic pressure uh, for the interstitial fluid? Yes. Oops. Excellent. Again, this is the force of the blood against, pardon me, force of the water mm. against its boundaries. I'll try not to take that personally. Against its boundaries, excellent. As it's pushing <laughs> against those, this <laughs> is just teasing. Against its boundaries, uh, uh, against its boundaries. And so in this case, with this force in relation to the capillary be an inward or an outward force? Inward. Inward. Exactly, because in this case, what is going to happen is that there, 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 uh, it is going to be trying to force water into the capillary. And of course, there is going to be stuff in our interstitial fluid. So there is going to be an osmotic of the interstitial fluid. And with that osmotic pressure in the interstitial fluid, it is going to draw water towards it. Water is drawn to the stuff. And if water is being drawn to the stuff in this case, is that going to be an inward or an outward force? in relation to the capillary. Outward. Outward. Whoops. Outward force. Excellent. So let's draw that. Perfect. So there you go. Notice we have these four forces, two inward, two outward, two hydrostatic, two osmotic. And collectively, when we take all of these together, what we can determine is we are going to be able to determine, and I can do this right here, and make it big. 
our net hydrostatic pressure. And this net, pardon me, pardon me, oops, net filtration, sorry. The net filtration pressure. And this net filtration pressure is going to help us determine if our water and stuff move out or in to the capillary. All right. Now, of course, we have to have a way to calculate this. So we are going to calculate the net filtration pressure by taking the net osmotic, pardon me, net hydrostatic pressure And from that, we are going to subtract the net osmotic pressure. Of course, to do that, we need to figure out how we would calculate that net hydrostatic pressure. And how do you think we would do that? Hydrostatic minus osmotic? Well, no, if I want the net hydrostatic pressure, I need to know the differences between the two hydrostatic pressures. So what I need to do is I need to take, uh, so no, not the, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary. And from that, we are going to subtract the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid. And if we now know how to calculate the net hydrostatic pressure, how do you think we put this here, are going to calculate the net osmotic pressure? Same way. So which one do we take first? What's going on inside the capillary or what's going on outside the capillary? The capillary. Yep, capillary always goes first, exactly. So we take the osmotic pressure of the, of the blood. And from that, we subtract the osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid. The reason we precisely set this up this way is this. And let me sheet a little bit. I'm going to move this up, move that up, move that up, move that up this up and this up is the reason we set it up this way is then when we are dealing with all of these pressures for the net osmotic pressure the net hydrostatic pressure and the net filtration pressure when we're dealing with all of these what will happen is a positive pressure is going to equal an outward force and a negative pressure is going to equal an inward force. So by setting it up this way, we get that consistency of what our pressures are going to be. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. If we understand all these pressures, then all we need are numbers and we can do some math. Let's go back and get some numbers. All right, and again, your book uses these eloquent terms push and suck. Hydrostatic pushes the water away, osmotic sucks the water towards it. So if you like that, I think outward and inward makes better sense. But again, each hydrostatic is pushing away. Each osmotic is pulling towards it. Outward forces cause filtration, cause things to leave the capillary. And inward forces cause things to enter the capillary. 
Our outward forces include the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which again, as I mentioned, is essentially the blood pressure in the vessel. And as, whoops, as I mentioned, I guess I gotta move that sheet and put it here. And one of the big deals about the capillary hydrostatic pressure is it is different at the arterial end at the venous end. At the arterial end, it is 35. At the venous end, it is 17. We also have our interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure. Right, that is that osmotic pressure of the suspension of the interstitial fluid drawing the water towards it. Now let's think about this one. That water inside the capillary is close by the capillary wall. The capillary is tiny, only one blood vessel, uh, one red blood cell in diameter. Whereas this uh, interstitial fluid is inside of the entire tissue. Is the interstitial fluid forced to sit up right next to the blood vessel, right next to that capillary? Is it being forced against the wall of the capillary? No, it's got the ability to diffuse through the entire tissue. So do you think that if it's able to move through the entire tissue, it's gonna have a huge draw on the uh, water to help pull water out? No, and in fact, the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure is only about one in a typical capillary. Now it can vary from as low as a half a millimeter of mercury up to five millimeters of mercury. So it can vary in different tissues, but it's not typically very high. Our inward forces, forces uh, cause things to enter the capillary. And as we talked about, that is our blood colloid osmotic pressure. Now, the blood colloid osmotic pressure is how the amount of stuff in the blood draws water to it. There is a pressure gradient as we go from the arterial end to the venous end in the blood pressure. But do you think the amount of stuff in the blood vessel changes dramatically from one end to another? No, it doesn't. And so at both ends inside the capillary, it is about 26 millimeters of mercury. Lastly, we have our interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. And again, as we talked about, is the water in the tissue being forced against the capillary? No. And so in fact, not surprisingly, the uh, Interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure is essentially zero. Now, are these important numbers that you should know? Uh -huh. Yes, these are indeed important pressures uh, that you need to know because these are the typical. However, in every single person in this class, are they going to be identical in everybody? No, exactly, exactly not. They're gonna vary from person to person. They're gonna vary from blood vessel to blood vessel. So while it is important to understand how we do this calculation, it, what do you think is more important? Memorizing these five numbers or memorizing the equations so that I could give you any numbers and you could come up with the correct answer? Equations. The equations, absolutely, the equations are going to absolutely positively be more important. So let's do some math. If we wanted to know the net hydrostatic pressure, we would take the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary minus the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid. What is the hydrostatic pressure? And let's do this first at the arterial end. At the arterial end, what would the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary be? 35. 35, excellent. Uh, what is the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid? 
17 or zero? Zero, excellent. All right, so when we put those two together, 35 minus seven, uh, zero equals, hopefully this, you shouldn't have to take your shoes and socks off to figure this one out. 35. Excellent, well, and I like that the positive 35, positive 35, and being a positive number, what does that tell you about the net hydrostatic pressure? Is it an outward or an inward force? Outward. Outward. Excellent. Our net osmotic pressure, we take the osmotic pressure of the capillary. What did we say that was again? 26, excellent. From that, we subtract the osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid. What was that again, a typical one? One. Which equals? 25. 25, excellent. All right. Excellent. And so then when we put them together into the net filtration pressure, our net hydrostatic pressure was 35. From that, we subtract 25. So what is our net filtration pressure? 10. Positive 10. And being a positive 10 number, what does that tell us? Outward force. Outward force. So at the arterial end, and let's go back to our, our picture. At the arterial end of our, um, what color should we use for this? Let's use orange. At the arterial end, we have a positive 10 net filtration pressure, and that tells us that this is an outward force. So at the arterial end of our capillary, we have an outward movement of materials, water and oxygen and nutrients and all of those things are released from the capillary into our interstitial fluid. Okay. But let's go back. Let's do the same thing now for the venous end. At the venous end, what was the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary? 17. 17, excellent. And the, hyper, uh, the, uh, the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid? Zero. So that equals 17, positive 17. Excellent. Osmotic pressure. Notice our net colloid osmotic pressure. Has that changed? No. No. So it's going to be 26 uh, minus 1, which is going to equal 25. And so then we put these together. Positive 17 minus positive 25 equals what? Negative 8 negative eight millimeters of mercury, which tells us what? It's an inward force. Inward force. So notice, at the venous end of our capillary, we have a net filtration pressure of minus eight which is an inward force, which means that at the venous end, we have water, waste, chemical signals, hormones, all these types of things moving into the capillary. Notice, as we talked about, it truly is an exchange of material. At the arterial end, water and substances leave, and at the venous end, water and substances enter into the capillary. So it truly is an exchange of materials. But there's one other thing I want you to notice about this. What's the other thing that you notice about these inward and outward forces? Are they equal? No. So that means what is pushed out of the capillary, is all of it necessarily brought back in? Or the same amount brought back in? No. No. So notice all of our capillaries are a little bit leaky. 
more stuff exits the capillaries than enters back into the capillaries. Meaning that slowly, bit by bit, a little bit of the plasma of your blood is drained out of your blood vessels. So why aren't your blood vessels completely empty by the end of the day? Because it's continuously moving and falling. True. Well, how do we how do we get that excess fluid that's now in the interstitial fluid back into our cardiovascular system? There we go. Alexa's got it. The lymphatic system. Remember, the lymphatic system we talked about takes that excess fluid out of the interstitial fluid and deposits it back into the cardiovascular system. And does it do it randomly? Just closes its eyes, grabs the fluid, and dumps it back into the heart? No. No, it filters it, it monitors it, it checks for abnormal cells, pathogens, all those types of things as well. We don't lose a lot. During the course of the day, you lose, what, two to three liters of fluid from your, uh, from your cardiovascular system? I know that sounds like a lot, but remember, as we talked about, right, in one minute of time, your entire, you know, uh, 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 volume of five plus liters of blood is pumped through your body, right? So again, that's a massive amount that's going on. So again, it's not so scary there, but let's say two to three liters leaves your capillaries during the course of the day, uh, 24 hour period of time, guess how much fluid the lymphatic system puts back into your cardiovascular system? Yeah, about two to three liters in a 24 hour period of time, exactly. So it may not move quite as fast or be not quite as strong of a current, but it makes up for that difference. And so, yeah, so they are a little bit leaky. And here we see that. Excellent. So again, know these numbers, but more importantly, know the equations. Understand how this works. Are you going to save this picture so we can print it like some of the other oh, pictures? Apparently not. Yes. Yeah, hold on. No, okay. no I, I, I erased it by accident. That was, I, I, I pushed clear instead of save. The two buttons are right next to each other. So that was not on purpose. Okay. Um, so yeah, excellent. All right, perfect. So we did that, we did that, we did that. We calculated all of that. And here's the pretty picture from your textbook. At the arterial end, we got that positive 10 out. At the venous end, the negative eight back in. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So as we were talking about, those capillaries are a bit leaky. And if we're not good about getting that fluid back into the cardiovascular system, we get edema. Edema is an abnormal increase in interstitial fluid. And there are many things that can cause it, like injury. What in particular about an injury causes edema to occur in an area? It swells up so it can get the nutrients that area to help fix it. True, absolutely. What causes it though? Tra hitting something, trauma. Right, so, but, so I slam my hand in the car door and I get edema as a result of it. What is the trigger that lets my body know that this has been injured so that it swells as a result of that? I know you, oh, there it is. Alexa's got a histamine. Excellent, histamine, right? Histamine uh, causes that dilation of blood vessels, causes the blood vessels to become more leaky, right? So again, think about, now that we've talked about these equations, histamine dilates blood vessels. If we dilate blood vessels, we bring more blood to the capillary. And if we bring more blood to the capillary, more blood in the capillary increases blood pressure and if we increase blood pressure, more water is going to be forced out, right? It also uh, increases the permeability of the capillaries, making it easier for the fluid to leak out as well. So both of these things increase the amount of fluid in the interstitial space, leading to that edema. Right, so excess filtration, inadequate reabsorption, right? Maybe, um, maybe you've got uh, problems with your lymph nodes, or maybe because of precancerous cells, you had to have lymph nodes removed, right? You get lymph nodes removed from your armpit, and suddenly you get your arm swelling as a result of that. It makes it harder to get your ring off when you get to the bar on Friday night, right? Because of that swelling, you've broken up those lymphatic vessels and it's harder to drain that blood. So it could be inadequate reabsorption, excess filtering, 
all those types of things. And as we talked about, that edema causes things like tightness in the joints, uh, if it's in the pulmonary system, as we talked about, it can have difficulty breathing, swelling of the tissue. And again, like I said, if my hand swells and my fingers get a little tight, it's not as big of a deal. It might be uncomfortable, right? Although often, uh, oops, often it's not noticeable till you can get about 30% above normal before you really become aware of it. But where do we want to make sure that this edema is not occurring? Your heart. Heart would be one place, but where's the other place? Brain. Right, um, inside the cranial cavity, right? Inside that cranial um, cavity can be a major, major issue if it occurs then. All righty. Questions on that? If you... And then it stays, does that mean it's like above the 30% normal? I'm sorry, you broke up at the beginning of what you were saying. Can you say that again? Um, you know, in like extreme edema, you can press on the skin and it's it will stay like a dip where you yeah. press, is that above the 30% normal? Uh, not necessarily because you can sometimes, that's sometimes one of the ways you become aware of it is as, as you find that, that that's the case or like a, a parasox is too tight or something along those lines as it comes off. Um, but yeah, obviously the more swollen it is, the more noticeable that will be, but you don't have to hit 30% for that to occur, right? Again, you don't even have to have edema for that to occur. If you wear a pair of compression socks, even if you don't have swelling in your feet, right? By the end of the day, as you take those socks off, you're gonna see that indentation in your ankle area where it's been squeezing that interstitial fluid out, not because there was excess there, but because you had that extreme pressure on it, causing it to be pushed out. All right, any other questions on that? All right, excellent. We are racing through this information, which I'm hoping is a good thing. Excellent. That is everything we had to do for our blood vessels. So what I want to do for the rest of this is to switch gears and talk about blood. Like I said, this seems a little early to take our second break, but let's go ahead and take our second break now so we can switch gears. So let's do this first. Let me stop sharing this. Let me close this one. And bring up this one. All right, so any questions on blood vessels before we switch gears? Any questions? All right, excellent. So then let's go ahead and take our second break. Uh, for the second break, we'll take again another 15 minute break. It looks like it is 2.02. So we'll come back at 2.17. And at 2.17, we will pick up the lecture with the last bit that we have to cover for uh, this section of the course. And that is going to be blood. So we will restart at 2.17. And I will start the recording at the top. All righty, excellent. Let's go ahead and get started. So last thing we need to cover for today uh, is we wanna start talking about uh, the blood. We've talked a lot about our cardiovascular system, the blood vessels and the heart, but now we have to talk about what they contain and that is of course the blood. So again, our cardiovascular system includes the heart, includes blood vessels, and it includes the blood. What tissue type is blood again? Connective. Connective, excellent. All right, how do we know? Because that's what we learned in 430. What are the criteria for connective tissue? Connective tissue, like all tissues, are comprised of cells, right? All tissues are made up of cells. But what else are connective tissues comprised of? Uh, plastic? Plastic? Yeah. Okay, so fibers, one thing that can be there is fibers. Right, yeah. And I'm sorry, say again? Hi. Fibers and what else? Well, you get the right idea. Alexa's got the right idea. The fibers and whatever that's something else together make our extracellular matrix. Right. 
and it is the matrix that gives our connective tissues their properties. What was the third component? What was the other thing that along with fibers make the extracellular matrix or the inorganic matrix? Collagen. What was the other component? Water is a part of it. Inner fluid. It is the, basically the fluid component of it, but that fluid component had a special name. Remember, we call it ground that substance, okay. right? The ground substance. So basically a connective tissue is cells and uh, matrix, uh, fibers and ground substance. Those are the two main components of a connective tissue. So let's check. Does blood have cells? Yes. Okay, we say yes. Give me examples. Erythrocytes and leukocytes. Excellent. And thrombocytes. And thrombocytes. Excellent. I like it when you guys use fancy terms with me. Erythrocytes. Uh, I heard leukocytes. Oops. And I heard thrombocytes. Them be fancy terms. Remind me again what a erythrocyte is? Commonly red blood cell. Red yeah, red blood, red blood cell. cell. Excellent. The leukocytes are commonly known as the white blood cell. White blood cells. Excellent. And what are thrombocytes? Platelets. 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 <laughs> Excellent. But as you guys correctly and obviously know, you need to use the appropriate uh, anatomical terms for these things. And so erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes are absolutely correct. But let's think about this a little bit further, right? When we talk about cells, we're really talking about true cells. And we learned all the characteristics of true cells way back in 430. What do we know about erythrocytes? Based on what we heard about what true cells are, do erythrocytes meet the criteria for being a true cell? No. What do you need to have to be a true cell? A nucleus. Nucleus, organelles, right? All sorts of things like that. Does a erythrocyte have that? No. No, basically it's a big bag of hemoglobin. It doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have most organelles. So in that sense, in the truest sense of the term, it is not really a true cell. It was at one time of its life. It starts as a true cell but then it ends up chucking its nucleus, chucking its organelles, and just being a big uh, bag of hemoglobin. What about leukocytes? Are leukocytes true cells? Yes. Yeah, they have nuclei, they have organelles, they can divide, they can make proteins, they can do all the things that we need a true cell to do, and they look for the most part like true cells. What about thrombocytes? No. No, no. they're made up of cells. Yeah, they're actually cells. cells. Yeah, they're cell pieces. They're the arms and legs of other cells that have basically been ripped off. There's a big, huge cell called a megakaryocyte, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit, uh, that basically is responsible for basically making platelets. Platelets are cell pieces. So again, they came from cells, but again, in the truest sense, they're not true cells while they're in the blood. So yes, technically we have true cells. The leukocytes meet those. Erythrocytes used to be true cells. Thrombocytes came from true cells. But we still have this sticky issue of definitions. We do cheat with blood a little bit by getting around that by saying that all three of these things collectively are formed elements. So instead of saying cells, we use the term formed elements. And then that way, things that used to be cells or things that are pieces of cells can all collectively work together to be our cells and meet that criteria for the connective tissue. All right. Does uh, our blood have an inorganic matrix? Yeah, absolutely. It's the plasma. Uh, it would be wrong to call them a cell on a test to be counted as wrong. Um, no, not necessarily. The, my hesitation isn't that I think that it's necessarily wrong to refer to them as cells. I was just trying to think of a situation where I would, where cells would be the correct answer. I guess if I technically ask you the question, what do erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes collectively known as, and you write cells, then yeah, I probably would only give you partial credit for that. 
because technically they're cells, but formed elements is a better answer. So I wouldn't say that it's wrong. I would say that that's just a, a simpler answer or more general answer. And it's always better to be more specific. Right. But, but again, they are the cell or cell like things. And so rather than having to always hedge our bet when we say that, often we just use the term formed elements. Okay. All right. Excellent. The, oh, helps I spell it right. Plasma is our inorganic matrix. And what is unique about plasma as an inorganic matrix? It's fluid. Yeah, it's the only fluid matrix. Excellent. Perfect. Now, obviously it has water and stuff like that. Dissolved in the water. So that meets our criteria for ground substance. But what about fibers? To be a true connective tissue, our blood has to have fibers in it. And does your blood have fibers? Fibers just floating around inside of it? No. No? Then it's not a true connective tissue, is it? Unless it does have fibers. Oh, does it have fibers? Sure. Turns out it does. It does indeed have fibers. Very special fibers. Uh, one, expense, one example of them is... Uh, uh, fibrinogen. Uh, fibrinogen. Oops. Fibrinogen. There you go. Excellent. Is a very important water soluble fiber. We certainly don't want water insoluble fibers floating around in the blood because then they would get clogged in all of the capillaries and we'd have major. Uh, circulation issues as a result of that. However, when you cut yourself, do chemical signals cause that fibrinogen to come out of solution and become fibrin, a water insoluble fiber that helps to form the clot and ultimately the scab that allows the blood to stop and the healing process to begin? Absolutely. Right. So yes, we do have water soluble fibers. We do have ground substance. We do have cells. We have met all of the criteria and absolutely positively uh, our uh, blood is indeed a connective tissue. All right. But as we have also seen from our capillary exchange, we know that the water and the stuff in our blood is intermixed with our interstitial fluid. Because of that exchange of materials that takes place in the capillaries, what happens in our blood changes our interstitial fluid, changes our tissues, right? That's why, like I said, if you drink a massive amount of water in a very brief period of time to win a video game system, right? You can upset the tonicity of your blood, which upsets the tonicity of your organs, leading to cellular death, leading to organ failure, and ultimately leading to death. So when we talk about the movement of uh, plasma and the substances in the plasma and the blood, we are talking about that extracellular fluid as well. Is there any way to that? I'm sorry, go again. Is there any way to reverse that? Uh, theoretically, you could probably inject a hypertonic solution, but to get it to circulate and get the tonicity right in that would probably be really challenging. I mean, so again, I'm thinking just from a theoretical, you know, standpoint as opposed to what would clinically be healthy. Uh, obviously, it wasn't the case in uh, the, the case that happened many years ago here in Sacramento. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm sure that the dialysis and other things, there might be ways to try to help to fix it on a short term. Right. In the long term, again, depending on how extreme it is, the body's going to self-regulate with the kidneys releasing excess fluid or doing things along those lines. So again, it'll try to reestablish balance. But if that's extreme, then, then, then you cause more damage than the body has a chance to recuperate from it. All right, and obviously the, the study of the blood is the field of hematology. All righty, excellent. What is the primary function of the blood? When we think of blood, what do we think of? 
distribution. Transportation. Transportation, excellent. Transportation, but transportation of what? Gases, waste. And by uh, gases, what primary gases are we talking about? Oxygen and carbon dioxide. Yep. What else? Nutrients and heat. Oops, I like that. Nutrients, heat. And hormones. Hormones and other chemical signals. <laughs> what else? Waste. Waste. Yep, it's not all good stuff. Wastes. Water. Yep, can't forget that water. We just finished talking about that. And uh, toxins, right? Things like that as well. I think those are some of the main things. Excellent. Now, when we talk about all of the things that are oh, ions, I mean, there's pletty more. Uh, Etc. other stuff along those lines. Almost everything transported by the blood is transported by what? Plasma. Blood plasma. The plasma, excellent. All right. The heat, the nutrients, the water, all those things are transported by the plasma. And said, there's that pesky almost everything. What is the one big exception? There you Oxygen. Go. Oxygen. Oxygen instead is transported by what? Erythrocytes. Erythrocytes. And for space, I'm just going to put RBCs here uh, by the red blood cells. And, and as we know, of course, more specifically by the hemoglobin inside of those red blood cells. Uh, but we will talk about that as well. Oxygen is the one thing, uh, something like 98%, 98.5% of all the oxygen is transported by the hemoglobin in our erythrocytes. And only about 1.5% is transported in the plasma. So again, technically, even the plasma does transport some oxygen but is one and a half percent of the carrying capacity of your blood going to be enough to meet the needs of your body? No. No, of course not. Absolutely not. So instead, uh, we have to rely on that hemoglobin for getting all the oxygen that we need to the parts of the body. Excellent. So obviously transportation is a huge part of that and all the things that are transported by that. But it does say functions, plural, up there. What else does our blood do for us? Regulates. Okay. Regulates what? Uh, pH. Okay. Regulates, because again, remember, since it is basically interchanged with our interstitial fluid, it helps to regulate the conditions of our interstitial fluid. Like pH, like temperature, uh, like uh, ion composition. Exactly, things along those lines. So it plays an important role in that regulation of things like that, body temperature. Dilating and constricting blood vessels brings that heat towards the core of the body. Water comes to the cells and everything else. And does it do anything else? Protects. It protects us, absolutely. It protects us in a couple of ways. It protects us from harmful materials from the outside world, those hairy, scary pathogens that we'll talk about in the next section. But as we also finished talking about, it helps us to maintain a hemostasis. Hemostasis is the process by which we maintain the appropriate levels of blood in our body. So again, if we cut ourselves, we get that uh, plasma plug, uh, pardon me, that platelet plug. We get that clot that forms. We stop that blood loss to maintain the amount and volume of blood in our system. So that important hemostasis. And we'll talk about that process in a little bit of detail at the end of the next lecture. All right. What are some of the physical characteristics of blood? If you had a whole big bucket of it sitting next to you here in the classroom, what would it look like? What would it feel like? What would it taste like? Tell me what you know about blood. Sticky, liquid. Okay, it's liquid, absolutely, we know that. It's viscous. Viscous, excellent. Um, it's iron. Say again? Like, tastes like iron? Yeah, it's got a metallic taste because of the iron in it, absolutely. All right. Oops. Neutral pH? Yeah, relatively neutral pH. It's opaque. 
opaque. A little okay. sweet. I'm sorry? Sweetness a little bit. Well, maybe. I, thought, I, I, I would say the metallic taste is probably more prominent than any kind of sweetness or something like that. Uh, what else? Red. Okay, it, it is all blood red? No. No. So what's the other half of the blood? Blue? Blue. Right? You can't look at a chart or a model or anything that doesn't show red and blue blood vessels on them because blood comes in two flavors, red and blue. Oxygen and the oxygen. Not blue, though, right? It's scarlet red and deep uh, dark red. There you go. I think that a little bit better. Absolutely. You are absolutely positively correct. There is no such thing as blue blood, right? Yes. I think uh, you are correct in that blood color changes based on the oxygen it carries. Right, so blood color does indeed change based on the oxygen that it carries. And what are the two general states of blood in the body? Oxygen rich and oxygen poor. Excellent, oxygen rich and oxygen poor. We do not have deoxygenated blood in the body. Deoxygenated would mean that the blood had no oxygen in it. And if your blood has no oxygen in it, please see a doctor immediately, right? Oxygen-rich blood means that there's a large amount of oxygen bound to that iron you guys were talking about in the hemoglobin. And so it gets a very bright red coloration to it. So again, if you had a bucket of blood sitting here next to you, the oxygen from the uh, surrounding environment would mix with it and it would get nice bright red. How many people here have donated blood before? I see at least one hand up, two hands. A couple people have said me, excellent. Someone else raised their hand, perfect. When they take your blood, they usually take it from a superficial blood vessel. And which superficial, which blood vessels tend to be more superficial? AC. Right. The, which, right. Yeah. So the anticubital, excellent. But the anticubital what? Vein. Vein. Uh, me, me, pardon, medium cubital vein. Exactly, a vein. And as we know, systemic veins are oxygen poor. So when they take that blood out and they put it in that vacuum sealed bag, is it bright red? No. Is it blue? No. No. no it's dark it is red. a dull, dark. exactly. As someone said, it's a dull, deep scarlet red. So again, there is there are differences in coloration. Now, that darker, deeper, duller colored red in those superficial blood vessels that are close to the surface, especially if you tend to have lighter pigmented skin, can often be seen through that lighter pigmented skin. And the way they refract the light, there is a bluish appearance to it, right? In fact, again, because of the mass amount of inbreeding that went in with the royal families in uh, in Europe and things along those lines, we often refer to those individuals as blue bloods because they tended to be, have, could be paler in color and those superficial veins and all the other uh, problems that they would have would show through. And so that's where that term comes from. And again, we, you can't, every single model that's ever been made uses red and blue for the blood vessels, but there's no such thing as blue blood. And there's no such thing as oxygen, uh, deoxygenated blood. We have oxygen rich and oxygen poor, both refract light at different rates because of the oxygen binding to the iron of our hemoglobin, giving us that dull or that deep red color. Excellent. I think we got most of it. Let's take a peek at uh, what we came up. Viscous, sticky, opaque, metallic taste. Ah, that's the one you guys forgot. Warm, right? If you cut yourself and that blood comes on your hand, it has a warm temperature to it. Typically, your blood is two to three degrees warmer than your core body temperature because it's transporting that heat. That's why if we were to run around the room 16 times, right, your blood vessels on the skin would dilate to radiate that excess heat out. Relatively uh, neutral pH, pH is typically between 7.35 and 7.45, a very narrow range. And like we said, a typical person has a little bit over uh, five liters of blood in their body. All right. Questions on that? And we just did the color so we don't have to do that again. Perfect. Excellent. These conditions are primarily maintained by very negative feedback controls to maintain the overall volume and the composition of the blood. Because, like I said, it has such a huge influence 
on our tissues and how our tissues function. If you're to take a small amount of the blood out of your body, again, notice your whole blood only makes up about 8% of your entire body weight. And if we were to take that and spin it around really, really fast, not only would we get the blood dizzy, but the other thing that we would do is we would separate it, be able to separate it into our blood plasma and those formed elements. Now the formed elements, the, again, the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, and the thrombocytes. Notice our blood on average is around 45% formed elements, and we have a specially name for that. We use the term hematocrit. The hematocrit is a measure of the amount of formed elements you have in your blood. And there are all sorts of characteristics that can affect and influence that, where you live, uh, whether you are a male type person or a female type person, uh, all sorts of other characteristics can influence that overall hematocrit. When it separates out, it actually primarily separates into three distinct regions. We have our plasma, as we mentioned. We have our red blood cells, which are the largest and the heaviest characteristics and features, formed elements. Uh, and then a tiny little white stripe known as the buffy coat that contains the thrombocytes and the white blood cells, which make up just a very small portion. Uh, the red blood cells make up about 99% of the formed elements. So often when they use that term hematocrit, I erased it, so I'll put it back. Really, they use that term kind of interchangeably with your red blood cell count. Since the red blood cells make up over 99% of the formed elements. So they kind of use those two terms interchangeably. Technically, hematocrit is the amount of formed elements, but it's, most, uh, it's, it's almost exclusively used as a red blood cell count. All right, let's talk about these components, talking first about your plasma. A plasma, as I said, is primarily water, about 92% water and then about 7% plasma proteins. Your book does a really nice job of listing all of the proteins, so I'm not gonna take the time to go through all of them, but there are some key proteins I do wanna talk about and emphasize. Starting first with albumins. Albumins is our most common plasma protein. And its primary function is to help to maintain the osmolarity of the blood. Now, when I use that term osmolarity of the blood, what am I referring to? Osmotic pressure. It is related to the osmotic pressure. So let's put that in parentheses. Why is it related to the osmotic pressure? What is the osmolarity of the blood? Or the osmolarity of anything? All right, here, let's do it this way. I have two beakers, beaker one and beaker two. Both beakers contain exactly one liter of water in them. And in one of them, I put uh, one mole of glucose. And in the other, I put one mole of, oops, that's not a one, of salt. Do these two now have the same osmolarity? No. Yeah. What do you say no, Alex? Uh, salt attracts water more so than glucose. True, but they both have the same amount of water in them. It's a different chemical compounds. True, they are different chemical compounds. That is true. Okay, well, let me, let me do this instead then. Uh, let's say I put one mole of glucose in this one, and I put one mole of glycogen into this one. 
Same osmolarity or different osmolarities? Here, size is a big difference. So do they have the same osmolarity or different osmolarity? Look, I, I res truly respect the fact that you guys have forgotten most of chemistry because I hate chemistry as much as everybody, probably more. Right? But occasionally it is useful. Osmolarity is the measure of the amount of stuff. Yeah. It'll be the same. So in this case right now, whether it's one mole of glycogen, one mole of glucose, or one mole of ferrets, the <laughs> osmolarity is going to be the same because you have the exact same number of things in it. Size doesn't matter. What the thing is doesn't matter. It's the number of things that are dissolved in the water. So let's go back to my original question. Is the osmolarity the same here? Yes. Yes. No. Why not? Glucose is a much bigger molecule. So does it have the bigger osmolarity? It's about density. Nope. Like I said, it warms the cockles of my heart that you guys don't know your chemistry, but this is kind of important. Not only does salt dissolve, but when salt dissolves, salt disassociates, absolutely. When this glucose dissolves in water, it becomes one mole of glucose dissolved in the water. But you guys are right. When salt enters into water, it disassociates, becoming one mole of sodium ions and one mole of chloride ions. Notice a glucose is much larger than a sodium ion, but how many glucose do we have? One mole. How many things do we have in the salt water? Two moles. Two moles of salt water. So it's not size, it's not the composition, all it is is a count of things. So albumins being the primary protein is the primary thing that is in the water that helps us to maintain our osmolarity. Now, it isn't just about things. Albumin does have some functions. And one of the functions of albumin is to kind of help us to maintain, um, oops, did I want to erase that one yet? Yeah. Oh, no, actually, we can leave that. Um, one of the things that it does is it helps us to maintain our, so many of our plasma proteins help us to maintain our ion composition of our plasma too. And if albumin is the most common uh, pro plasma protein, what uh, ion do you think it helps us to regulate the levels of? It's the most common ion in the body. Sodium. Right. So it also helps us to regulate sodium levels. Excellent. There are large numbers of globulin proteins found that do all sorts of different things. The ones that are going to be most important and most relevant to us in this class is a class of globulins known as immunoglobulins. And don't get me wrong, immunoglobulins is an incredibly fun word to say just rolls off the tongue. It is super enjoyable. But there is another name for them. What is the other name for immunoglobulins? What are immunoglobulins also known as? Antibodies. Antibodies. Excellent. Those, of course, play a very vital role in our immune response. So those immunoglobulins are our antibodies that help us to protect our body. Our water-soluble protein, fibrinogen, that we talked about, that protein fiber, that again becomes fibrin and plays an important role in our blood clot and scab and healing process. And again, those are just three common plasma proteins. Your book lists others. And then obviously, if we do the math, that only makes 99%. So the other 1% is primarily the stuff that is being transported by the plasma. Things like the electrolytes, things like nutrients, things like hormones, gases, wastes like urea, uh, and things along those lines as well. All right. Questions on that? 
All right, excellent. Oh, and there's the pretty picture from your textbook talking about uh, some of the stuff that you find in the plasma. All right. Useful information, not terribly exciting. Excellent. Let's talk more about our formed elements. Our erythrocytes, our leukocytes, which come in two flavors, granulocytes and agranulocytes. What do you think the difference between a granulocyte and an agranulocyte? Was there a question on the plasma before we moved on? I heard a chirp of noise. So is there a question on the plasma before we moved on? All right. Like I said, useful information, not terribly interesting. Erythrocytes, leukocytes, which come in two flavors, granulocytes and agranulocytes. What do you think the difference between them are? Granules. Yeah, granules. Right. Granulocytes have granules. Oops. Excellent. And uh, agranulocytes do not have granules. Excellent. And then, as we also mentioned, our thrombocytes, those cell pieces. So here we see the different ones of those. And again, there are five main types of leukocytes that fall into one of those two categories, granulocytes or agranulocytes. We will talk about those in the next class. What I want to focus on for the rest of this class is our red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells, our erythrocytes, are by far the most common of our formed elements. A single drop of blood, one microliter of blood, contains somewhere on the order of 5 million erythrocytes inside of it. Again, I'm not the anatomist who counted those, but I'm not going to double check his work. I will take his word for it. So if you think about a single drop of blood having 5 million of these, that is an incredibly astounding number. When we look at the red blood cells, as we see in the picture here, one of the things that you guys pointed out to me before is that it is a nuclear. It does not have a nucleus. What else is special about this red blood cell when you look at it? The shape. Bi-concave. Absolutely. It has a very unique shape. It has what we call a biconcave shape. In that where basically it has a concave surface on both sides. So concave on one side, concave on the other, and then this enlarged circular region on the outside. It's kind of like a donut where the hole has not been pushed all the way through. Right? Uh, what's the advantage of this anatomy? Or more specifically, advantages of this anatomy, this biconcave shape? The high surface area? Excellent. It has a very large surface to volume ratio which as we know is gonna be important for diffusion. The binding and unbinding of oxygen inside of this cell is completely passive. There is no energy use. So again, this is a passive process. So having that massive surface to volume ratio is very, very important for that. Any other possible advantage? I did say advantages, plural. They can fold and squeeze through small spaces. Excellent. It gives it flexibility in movement. Right? Yeah, be careful with the holding more oxygen. It allows for the diffusion of more oxygen. You think about it, if we blew it up as a big ball, like a big balloon, it would be able to carry more oxygen inside of it, but it would be harder to get that oxygen into and out of that cell. So it makes it for a better transportation of oxygen, but it wouldn't necessarily affect its overall volume of oxygen that it can hold. But you're right. Remember, these red blood cells have to get through those capillaries that become one red blood cell uh, thin in diameter. So having that flexibility to be able to move through those helps in the transportation of materials through those tiny spots like the capillaries. Excellent. All right, let's talk a little bit about the internal anatomy. As we talked about in 430, our red blood cells are primarily big bags of hemoglobin. Here, 
we see what this protein hemoglobin actually looks like. So I'll do a simple schematic of this, where as you can see, it is primarily made up of four subunits, two alpha subunits, and two beta subunits. These are big globular proteins, but at the center of all of them, they have this heme group. And pretend those are all nice perfect circles, what we call a heme group. Oops. That heme group. And at the center of each of these heme groups is an iron atom. And that atom of iron basically works to attract oxygen, just like that Studebaker you have out on your front yard. And as you know, when oxygen and iron comes together, you get rust. And what color is rust when it first forms? Reddish. Reddish coloration. And this is where the red from the red blood cells comes from, from that binding of the oxygen to the iron. And that's why the more oxygen that binds, the brighter the red color becomes. I'm not here. Uh, no worries. Um, the more oxygen the binds, the brighter the red becomes. Now, when that oxygen binds the iron on that, um, you know, on the uh, hood of your Studebaker, right, they don't let go. You can't really get rid of that rust. But what's magical about this hemoglobin is that it reversibly binds oxygen. Oxygen can bind to it, but oxygen also can be released from it as well. All right. And again, I have done an amazing job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Here is that heme pigment. And again, you don't have to memorize and draw this, but I want you to see it. And it's got that iron at the center of it. Now, if each iron can bind one oxygen, then a single hemoglobin protein can bind four oxygen. So one hemoglobin can bind up to four oxygen. And remember, as we said, red blood cells, those erythrocytes, are basically big bags of hemoglobin. One red blood cell has something on the order of 250 million hemoglobin inside of it, each one being able to bind four oxygen to it. And that's just one red blood cell. Remember, a single drop of blood has 5 million red blood cells in it. So how much oxygen can a single drop of blood hold? Let's see. A whole lot. A whole lot, exactly. Right, 280 million times four times five million equals a lot. <laughs> Massive oxygen carrying capacity for our blood, and this is where that comes from. All right. As I mentioned, over 99% of the formed elements are our red blood cells. So when we talk about that hematocrit, which we said was 45 on average, um, it, uh, we're basically talking about the red blood cells. Those two are almost used interchangeably. Now, again, as I mentioned, things like age, things like race, things like sex can make a difference. Uh, statistically, the average in females is about 42%, the average in males in 46 and while mathematically that may be significant, uh, you know, from a statistics standpoint, from a functional standpoint, it isn't significant. However, obviously, the amount of oxygen you can carry in your blood makes a difference. If you are not able to carry enough oxygen to meet the needs of your body, we consider you to be anemic. And there are almost a dozen different types of anemia right, because there's all sorts of different possible uh, causes. Again, anemia is just the condition where you are not able to carry enough oxygen to meet the body's needs. There can be any number of causes of this. One of them is that you may not be making enough red blood cells or maybe you're losing red blood cells because you were injured, or maybe you produce a non-functional form of the hemoglobin, or maybe someone's holding a bag over your head, 
right? There could be any number of reasons why you're not able to meet the oxygen carrying needs of the body. And that basically that would be the case of being anemic in those cases, right? Conversely, if you are an endurance athlete, uh, bicyclists were probably the most famous examples of these, right? If you're a bicyclist and you're not cheating, you're not trying, right? And so one of the things uh, that uh, iron deficiency would be another thing that would cause anemia. Absolutely. If you're not getting enough iron, you can't produce enough uh, hemoglobin. Absolutely. One of the things endurance athletes will do is that a month or so before a race, they will draw a pint of their blood out. And then uh, that allows them to regrow those red blood cells and get back up to their normal uh, hematocrit. Then the day of a race, they will take that pint of blood and put it back into their body. That dramatically increases the number of red blood cells they have in their body, which dramatically increases the oxygen carrying capacity of their blood, allowing them to get oxygen to their muscles much more efficiently meaning that they can produce ATP aerobically for a much longer period of time. And so they're able to go further, go faster, go longer without fatigue, which is awesome. They're in the race. They get the prize. They win the money, right? They get the fame and accolation as much as a bicyclist can get, right? But what's the problem in that? It's cheating. Okay, it's cheating. Yes, obviously there's the moral aspect of it. But yeah, I was thinking more from a biological standpoint, what's the problem with it? You have to stabilize your blood count again. Your well, uh, uh, or, yeah, or maybe you can't. But you've got, absolutely got the right idea. Remember, one of the things we talked about, blood pressure is related to two, many, uh, many factors, but two of the factors that affect blood pressure is blood volume. Increase the viscosity of your and blood. if you're putting, exactly, if you're putting a lot of blood in there, you've got a massive increase in blood volume which causes a massive increase in pressure, and you're increasing the viscosity of your blood. Endurance athletes typically will have a higher percentage. In fact, I think, and again, the rules on this are constantly changing, they can have up to a 55% hematocrit. Uh, because of those endurance athletes, they, they tend to make more red blood cells because of the stress they're putting on the body. But once it reaches a critical point, it can't be above that. And the reason for that is it increases the viscosity of the blood. So now you've got dramatic increase in blood pressure from the volume, uh, from the uh, viscosity of the blood. And remember, as we talked about, that's that afterload. Now your heart has to work that much harder to overcome that increased pressure to be able to pump the blood out. So your heart becomes less efficient, which means it has to pump stronger. It has to pump faster. You're putting tremendous stress on your heart. The long-term implications for that are really, really detrimental to the heart. But like I said, as long as you win, that's all that matters, right? Who cares what's happening to the inside of your body? It's just the winning that is all that matters, right? Don't they also inject like erythropoietin? Exactly. So that's another way that people do it as well, as we'll talk about the way you, so again, blood doping, bad, illegal, uh, so is erythropoietin for that matter as well. However, what one of the things that many uh, endurance athletes will do is they will go to elevations to train. The reason they go up at elevations to train is they pump less air in up there. Okay, not really, but uh, you've all probably experienced this because you have no problem down here in Sacramento walking up the three flights of stairs with your two bags of groceries to get to your apartment at the end of the day. But you go up to Tahoe for the weekend and just walking up the six stairs to get into the casino and you're already exhausted, right? Because when you're at elevation, there is dramatically less air pressure. So when you take in a volume of air into your lungs, it has less air in it because the air is more spread out. So there's less oxygen. And so you get fatigued more readily. So what they'll do is they'll train at, uh, they'll train at uh, elevation. And if they train at elevation, that helps to improve, right? Maybe you can't go live in Denver uh, for the year. So now they have masks that you can wear that restrict your oxygen flow while you're doing that, which I always find hilarious because the people who wear those wear them when they're working out. And yes, that deprives you of oxygen <laughs> when you're working out meaning that you're gonna fatigue more rapidly, and I'm not sure what the advantage of that is. But if the goal is to increase the amount of blood you have in your body, you need to be wearing that mask all the time. All right, so 
uh, again, not that efficient if you just wear it when you work out. You have to wear that mask all the time, which nowadays is a good thing to do anyway. Although don't do the ones with the vent, those are bad. But you get the idea. Um, all of these are things that can help to increase the amount of red blood cells, including you can take EBO, uh, erythropoietin, which uh, EPO, which is a hormone that the body naturally produces that tells by the kidney that tells the body, the red bone marrow, to make more red blood cells. So all of those are ways that they will try to increase their red blood cells. Taking the hormones, uh, blood doping are illegal. Going up to elevations and doing the hard work to get it is not. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So as we talked about, uh, red blood cells start as true cells, but once they chuck their nucleus, once they're just big bads of hemoglobin, they can't make proteins, they can't repair themselves, they can't divide, they can't do any of those things. So they only last about 100 to 120 days. It is a pretty short lifespan. However, it is a busy lifespan. During that period of time, they travel about 700 miles. Because they only last 120 days, and everybody here is more than 120 days old, that means you need to have the ability to make more blood cells. And hematopoiesis is the process by which we form make the formation of all blood cells. Again, by all blood cells, I mean all the erythrocytes, all types, of the leukocytes Oops. and those megakaryocytes uh, that make the uh, thrombocytes. All of these have to occur, right? We have to be able to make more of all of these. And where do you think this occurs? Where do we make more formed elements? Blood or bone marrow. And you get Red. partial credit for that. Red bone marrow. There we go. Red bone Red marrow. marrow. Right. Red bone marrow. Absolutely. In the red bone marrow. In the red bone marrow. Right. In an adult, I should say. Right. In an embryo, bone cells are made, uh, blood cells are made all over the place. The yolk sac, the liver, spleen, thymus, lymph nodes, red bone marrow. But in adults, you guys are absolutely correct, just in the red bone marrow. And where do we find that red bone marrow? Bones. Okay, let's be more specific. Every single bone all has red bone marrow in it? Long bones. Is the entire long bone filled with red bone marrow? No. No. Where do we find it? The, uh, the diaphysis? Medulla? Medullary cap. So the, the medullary cavity in the diaphysis is where we find our red bone marrow. I haven't written on here, so oh, what do you guys think? Now, to make that bone lighter, what do we fill the diaphyses of, of those long bones? Yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow. So where do we find the red bone marrow? Epiphyses of the long bones. Epiphyses, bone? excellent. In the epiphyses. Plural. Uh, the long bones. Anywhere else? Where else do we find red bone marrow? In the flat bones, like the pelvis. Yeah, flat bones, short bones, irregular. And let's say it this way in most. Are there some flat bones, short bones, and irregular bones that end up getting yellow bone marrow in them? Yeah. But most of them maintain their red bone marrow. And the epiphyses of the long bones maintain the red bone marrow as well. In that red bone marrow, we have a pluripotent stem cell. Some remind, someone remind me again what that means to be a pluripotent stem cell? Turn into anything, like any kind of cell? Is pluripotent able to become anything? Let's start with the easy part of this. Let's define stem cell first. How do we define stem cell? Like it can replace other cells. 
Okay. How? Reducing them. Okay, excellent. It is a cell that divides rapidly. to produce new cells, All right? So a stem cell is a cell that divides rapidly to produce new cells. Or if we wanted to be fancy, we would say that it is highly mitotic, All right? That it divides rapidly. So much so that can that cell do much of anything else? Does it have other jobs? If, if it's dividing rapidly? No, right? It's undifferentiated. It's undifferentiated, right? It's like a millennial. It doesn't have a job. So its job is basically to divide rapidly to produce new cells. Excellent. We have now defined stem cell. What does it mean to be pluripotent? There we go. I like that. It can become multiple things, but not everything. More than one. Right, excellent. I like that even better. It can become more than one thing, but not everything. What do we call the ones that can become everything? Stem cells. Well, these are all stem cells. What do we call stem cells that are capable of becoming any type of cell in the body? Embryonic stem cells? Omnipotent. There we go. Omnipotent. Oh, yeah. Omnipotent stem cells. And what about the skin cells? How many things can those stem cells become? Unipotent. They can become one thing. Excellent. All right. So there you go. We have a pluripotent stem cell, and this pluripotent stem cell is capable of producing all of the formed elements. All right, so we've defined a pluripotent stem cell, which again, you should have gotten or remembered from 430. But this pluripotent stem cell that is capable of becoming all of the formed elements is a hemocytoblast. In fact, what we are gonna learn is that when we talk about all of the formed elements, this is the primary stem cell for all formed elements. So on the exam, if you happen to see a histology slide of blood with an arrow pointing at a cell, and it asks you to identify the primary stem cell of the formed element, do you even need to look at what the arrow is pointing at? No. No, because what's the answer going to be? Hemocytoblast. Hemocytoblast. So there you go. If you see the question, what is the primary stem cell for this formed element? There's only one answer for that, and that is hemocytoblast. All right. Yep, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at taking those stem cells. Let us take a look at this. Voila. Here is the process of hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis. Both of those are, are acceptable terms. That is the process of making all of the formed elements. This process of making all formed elements is the process of hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis. You may use either of those. Notice in this process, we have, as I mentioned, uh, let's use that, one primary stem cell and, oops, that's not how you spell one, primary stem cell, and it happens to be a pluripotent stem cell, and that pluripotent stem cell is the hemocytoblast. Excellent. If I'm looking at this chart correctly, how many secondary stem cells are there? Two. Two. Excellent. So if on the exam instead, I ask you to identify the secondary stem cell,
How many correct answers are there to that? Two. There are two. Excellent. They are either this one over here, the myeloid stem cell. How many things can the myeloid stem cell become? Well, it can become three, but if you really follow the arrows all the way down, notice it can become the red blood cells, it can become the platelets, it can become four of our white blood cells. So how many things is that? Six. More than one. Yeah, well, there you go. That's the term I was looking for. The real key is that it's more than one. And notice if it's more than one, this is indeed still a pluripotent stem cell. However, look at our second secondary stem cell, that lymphoid stem cell. It is indeed still a stem cell, undifferentiated. Its job is to divide and make new cells. And no matter how many new cells it makes, if it makes a million new cells, how many different things can it become? Only one. Only one thing. So notice in this case, it is now a unipotent stem cell. So, uh, Professor, when referring to them, would the myeloid be a pluripotent secondary stem cell and the lymphoid be unipotent secondary stem cell? That is correct. Okay. So on the exam, uh, in the lab exam, or I could ask you to describe this process, so really lab and lecture exam, but in particular, I'm talking about the lab exam right now. On the lab exam, I can show you any of these formed elements. Whoops, not what I wanted. I wanted a box. Any of these formed elements, okay? I can show them in models. I can show them on charts. I can show them in illustrations. And I definitely will show them in histology slides. Not only do you need to be able to divide, uh, uh, try that again. Not only do you need to be able to identify them, but you are also, I could also ask you the function of them. And the other two questions I will ask you is to identify the primary stem cell of this formed element and the secondary stem cell of this formed element. But as I mentioned, right, how many primary stem cells are there? One. 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 So like I said, you don't even have to look at the arrow if you see that question. You know what the answer to that is. And being the smart, sophisticated student that you are, if I asked you instead to identify the secondary stem cell of this formed element and you weren't sure, which one should you guess? Myeloid. Myeloid. Because notice myeloid forms six of the formed elements and the lymphoid stem cell only forms one. So if you are 100% certain it's not a lymphocyte, then even if you don't know what it is, if you know it's not a lymphocyte, you know it has to be a myeloid stem cell. Uh, so I got this question privately. Do you need to know the third or the fourth stem cells? Not particularly. What I will say, and I'll, I'll warn you about this right now. Uh, I'm not sure where we're getting to this and if we're getting to this today or not. We are going to talk more specifically about uh, erythropoiesis, the process by which we make the red blood cells. So that is a process we will talk about in more detail. And you do need to know the intermediate stages for these. But uh, the good news is I'm not going to hold you responsible for the intermediate stages of this. So you're not gonna need to know the names of the intermediate stages or what's happening in where, but you will need to know which ones are related to this. You will need to know that this lymphoid stem cell oops, becomes the lymphocytes and this Myeloid stem cell can become monocytes, can become neutrophils, can become eosinophils, can become basophils, can form the megakaryocytes that make our platelets. And like I said, you'll need to know this pathway. So I'm not gonna make you know the intermediate steps of the white blood cells, but we do need to know the intermediate steps of the red blood cells. Okay. All right. Is this picture in the book? I'm sorry? Is this picture in the book? Yeah, I believe this picture is from your book, yes.
I have a question. Yes. So, um, what does it mean to be primary and secondary? It means primary produces those secondary or they go separate? Yes. So what happens is this hemocytoblast, when it divides, the new cell becomes one of two things. It either becomes a lymphoid stem cell or it becomes a myeloid stem cell. Okay. And how do you guess it's determined? What determines which of the two cells it makes? The hormones? Yeah. Although, let's be a little bit more broad in this case. Chemical signals. Some of those chemical signals will indeed be hormones that are released from organs in the body, get into our blood circulation, get to the red bone marrow. But there may be also local chemical cues uh, that'll differentiate which one it becomes as well. So absolutely. In fact, every single time you see a choice being made, what this becomes, right? Uh, what this becomes, all of these things where you see multiple possibilities, know that it is a chemical signal that is determining which of those ways, which of those things occur. And <coughs> you see a hint of this here because I think we already talked about it. Notice we kind of already talked about EPO. Notice EPO increases the number of these stem cells that become the precursors to the red blood cells, EPO increases the rate at which these grow, stimulating them to grow faster uh, and uh, become red blood cells more rapidly. And what is, what do you think EPO stands for again? EPO. Erythropoiesis. Erythropoietin. Remember erythropoietin was the hormone we said that some, uh, some athletes will inject to increase the number of red blood cells they have. And so that's one of the things that is tested for in those endurance athletes. Okay. So yeah, it's gonna be those chemical cues that are gonna determine it. So again, they all start from the primary stem cell, but go to different secondary stem cells. And so for every formed element, you must know their primary and their secondary stem cells. All right, and like I said, that is what they become is determined by chemical signals and horm hormones and other chemical signals. All right, where are we time-wise? Hold on one second. That picture is page 655. By the oh, way. thank you. Okay, I, was, yeah, I was looking for it. Thank you. And thank you guys for finding that. All right, excellent. You know what? We are actually doing really good. This is a dense process that I, I want to save and start from scratch on next one because I want to go from this to the, I want to do this, the white blood cells and all of those and the platelets all at the same time. So I think this is actually where we're going to call it a day at this point. So I don't have any other uh, lecture material that I want to cover for today. Uh, this, so I think this is a good stopping point for right now for this. Uh, that we'll still have plenty to lecture on Thursday. We'll have some time to do some histology on Thursday. And then also from there, we will um, uh, be able to do that question and answer review and, and everything else. But I think, I think this is good. I think this is a good stopping point. So I think this, we've covered enough material for today. So again, we're finishing a little early, but I'm okay with that because like I said, when we finish early like this, I expect you to be using this time uh, to be uh, working on the anatomy and the other materials. Again, I know all of you turned in your, I assume you've turned in your um, pathways, the, the, the cardiovascular exercises, and hopefully that helped you with the anatomy of the blood vessels, but really make sure you're looking at all the models, are the pictures that you can find, all the illustrations, because those are the kind of things you're gonna be tested on, right? One of the challenges in this is you never get to hold that heart model in your hand. So you're going to have to rely on pictures of those heart models or pictures of charts or pictures of illustrations. And again, as I've said, I'm not going to just take use the pictures in your textbook. The goal of this class is for you to learn and understand this material. Uh, and we do that by uh, knowing the material and not memorizing pictures. Uh, so again, so hopefully you're using this time wisely when we finish early like this. All right. Questions on any of that? Question for the... Um exercise we just turned in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of confused about the aorta and I know <laughs> this sounds really simple but um, would you name like the aortic arch or the ascending and the descending in the flow? 
Like so, is he going to yes. the brachiocephalic trunk? So might have been better asked this before it was actually due. But yes, as we talked about, and as your list shows, while there is one blood vessel that is the aorta, as we talked about in class, different parts of the aorta distribute blood to different parts of the body. So in many ways, we treat that single aorta as four different blood vessels. So if we were, for instance, following the path of blood to the tip of your toes, it would first go into the ascending aorta. From there, it would go into the aortic arch. From there, it would go into the thoracic aorta. Wouldn't it be the descending? No. And from there, it would go into the abdominal aorta. So there are four blood vessels there. So the aorta really makes up four blood vessels. Now, if you remember, as we mentioned, the thoracic and the abdominal aorta together collectively form what we call the descending aorta because it's the part that goes down and behind the heart. But descending aorta doesn't distinguish the distribution of the blood. Whereas what the aorta does above the diaphragm and what the aorta does below the diaphragm is very, very different. So I think it is more important and more meaningful, which is why I've listed them separately. If you look on your list, I don't think your list says descending aorta on it, does it? No, I was going off the lab book. I right. think. So yeah, so it doesn't have descending aorta on it because I would prefer that you be more specific, especially because of the whole point of cutting the aorta into the pieces is to really focus on what each part distributes blood to. Right? Doesn't descending it aorta Descending aorta, remember, just distributes blood to the heart. Aortic arch to the two sides of the head and the two arms. Thoracic aorta really just distributes to the ribs. And then abdominal aorta basically goes to all the visceral organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Right? I actually like that. That's a good essay question. So don't they all go through the ascending aorta? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you think about it, every single pathway on your list from the right atrium, uh, pardon me, from the uh, left ventricle, the very first thing that should be getting the blood is the ascending aorta. And then the aortic arch. Yep, yeah, because most of your destination, I mean, technically, if your destination was the heart, then it wouldn't go into the aortic arch. All right? Because it would go instead from the ascending aorta, it would go into the right or left coronary arteries. Yeah. Right? So if it was going to the heart. But if you're going to someplace systemically, which is what you were supposed to do, then yes, everything then goes to the, so from the ascending aortic to the aortic arch. So if you think about it, the first two things on everybody's list, no matter where you went, should have at least included those two uh, blood vessels. I think you just answered <clears throat> one of my questions, but okay. the coronary arteries are like the first thing in the ascending aorta, right? I'm sorry, say that again? So the coronary arteries, the right and left, are the first thing out of the ascending aorta, right? Yes. And like so they're right I, after the valve. I noticed someone wrote here about these are the four branches of the aorta. I wouldn't say that these are the branches. I'd be careful with that word branches. What I would say are these are the four maybe divisions of the aorta, dividing that way, because the branches are the things that come off of them. If you think about it, as we talked about, how many blood vessels branch off the ascending aorta? You just gave it to me, two, right? There are only two blood vessels that branch off of the ascending aorta. And those are the right and left coronary arteries. How many blood vessels did we say branched off the aortic arch? Three. Three, right? And we could name those, the brachiocephalic, uh, the uh, left uh, common carotid and the left subclavian, right? We counted how many in the abdominal were. I don't remember how many that was. But we could count the thoracic, I guess, because there are multiple, both left and right, posterior. So if you think about it, there's probably 24 because you have 12 ribs on both sides and they're the posterior ones on the back. So this is likely to be 24 uh, that are going to be here. Those are the 24 that come off those posterior intercostal arteries that come off of there. And anybody remember how many came off of the abdominal aorta? Four, three, four. Well, it's more than four. We had the superior and inferior mesenteric. We had the celiac, 
we had the two gonadal, we had the two renal. Super renal. <laughs> two, super but remember, renal. super renal aren't on your list, are they? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just learning the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, so I think it was seven. Seven sounds right. Two, four, five, six. Yeah. Yeah. So again, and those seven, those are the branches that come off of those, right? So that, so but those would, those I think of the branches. So that's why ascending aortic arch, thoracic, and abdominal, I think of more of the divisions of it, how we're cutting it up into pieces. Whereas the reason we do that is because of the number of branches that come off that then distribute the blood to different parts of the body. So we really don't even need to say descending aorta. We can say thoracic and abdominal. In fact, I prefer thoracic and abdominal. And, and especially on the second activity where I had you going to the toes and I gave you the number of steps that were there, I expected thoracic and abdominal. So if you just put descending there, then you were one blood vessel off. Now, if you, on your own pathway, you went you know, below the thoracic cavity, and you just said descending aorta, I would be okay with that uh, for that, because again, I'm grading this one for correctness. But on the exam, I think, again, that term descending aorta isn't on your list for a reason. It is more important to be more specific. I do have one more question about yeah. another artery. <laughs> um, if you're okay. coming down- okay, hold on. Let's, let's go back for one more second. Just again, uh -huh. I, I, again, I know sometimes, I feel sometimes like I'm being nitpicky about this, but let's take a look at this. Um, this is what I want. Oops, went too far. Right. Now, again, I didn't have a good blown up picture of this, so this doesn't quite work quite as well. But again, I'm just, it's the point I want to try to emphasize, right? On the exam, if I am pointing an arrow to this part of the aorta and this part of the aorta, and on the exam, I ask you what this top arrow is, and on the exam, I ask you what this bottom arrow is, right? Technically, descending aorta could be the correct answer for both of them, right? But isn't it better to say the top one is the thoracic aorta and the bottom one is the abdominal aorta? We can differentiate them more that way and talk about them that way. Yeah. So on the exam, if I gave you one of these two questions on the exam and you just said descending, then that's not specific enough for me. That's not, that's not specific enough. And you would only get partial credit for that. The answer to these two questions are not the same. Right? And, if, and technically, if you put descending, they would be. Okay. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Was that the, so? Uh, did I answer the other part you said? So we were talking about that the branches, Nick. Did I answer all of your question, or was there something more to that? No, you got it. Okay. Um, if you're coming down or the common carotid, and then you go toward, I think you're talking about veins. And then you go to the brachiocephalic. Before that, would you, because the subclavian joins together kind of with the, the brachiocephalic so, right before the break. I'm sorry, I'm kind of confusing. Um, you are. And here's yeah, what sorry. I would say. But so to sorry. be careful with, I, I understand what you are saying, but here is essentially what happens. Uh, essentially what happens is you have the internal jugular the larger one. So again, not carotid, internal. Oh jugular. yeah, the external. Sorry, I'm talking about veins. Yeah. Right. So internal, oops, internal jugular uh, that comes down and you are correct in that it meets up with the subclavian. Yeah. And those two together oops, come together to form The brachiocephalic vein. So my question, I guess, is would subclavian be part of the flow? No. Going back to if the you were coming down from the brain, you come out the internal jugular, and then the it's, again, internal jugular and subclavian come together to fuse to form the brachiocephalic. Technically, if you were coming from the outside, 
the external jugular does kind of fit into the subclavian. Okay, so, that's, yeah. although although it kind of it does kind of go there, but it also kind of feeds into it as well. So if you went from the external jugular straight into the brachiocephalic, I would accept that. But if you went from the external jugular to the subclavian and then the subclavian to the brachiocephalic, I would accept both of those. Because it was on the, the superficial part of your head. Right. Yeah, really, it's this merge point is where the brachiocephalic comes out. And here's where, you know, traffic gets a little confusing. It's like, it's kind of like where, you know, like business 80 and, and interstate 80 meet. There's this big, mm -hmm. huge merge. And if you were standing at one place of it, can you really say which part is 80 and which part is Interstate 80 and which one's Business 80 and all that? It kind of merges together. So yeah, things get a little sloppy in this merge area. So if you went straight to the brachiocephalic, I would be fine to that. If you went to the subclavian first and then went to the brachiocephalic, I would be fine with it either of those two ways. And honestly, I don't remember with the number of spaces which way I expected you to go. I think straight, but I don't recall. I'd have to look at it. Yes, I will let you know what parts are wrong, although as, uh, I believe there's a key that's posted, so you'll have that information there as well. So I think you can look at the key and see those things there. I think there's a key for that one. Yeah, there's a key for the cardiovascular exercises. So you'll see the ones. And then obviously for the sec for everybody's third and fourth, they've gone to different locations. So, uh, but for everything else, they, there is an answer key for that. And that should be available now or at four o'clock, I think it posted four. What time did that post at? Uh, yeah, posted at one, so it's available now. Yep, so remember in the modules, yep, all the keys for all of the reviews and, Cardiovascular exercise and things like that are there. All right. Any other questions? This is awesome. This is what this time should be used for. So if you guys have questions, now is the time to ask these things. All right. Everybody's brains full. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, we still, again, we still have a little bit of a road to hoe on uh, on Thursday. We'll finish off blood. We'll talk about blood typing, which again, you'll already have some familiarity with from doing your lab uh, uh, simulations again. Um, so again, everybody's quiz is different because everybody got different questions. So I can't just go over all the quiz questions. Like I said, if anybody has any questions on their quizzes, then I would encourage them to uh, make an appointment. To, or you don't have to, sorry, let me rephrase that. Come to my office hours. If you come to my office hours, you don't need to do an appointment. Uh, I'm here an hour before class. I log on at 11 o'clock and I'm in my office again, not here in this classroom, but in my, uh, a, but in my uh, classroom office, Zoom room, uh, which again, there's a direct link to from the homepage. And then also on um, Mondays and Wednesdays, I am there from uh, noon 30 to 1.30 uh, after my other class. If you have questions outside of office hours, uh, then yes, absolutely email me. We can make other arrangements. Uh, to meet up or we can communicate by email as well. In fact, Kirsten, I've been sending you texts uh, uh, through the chat window because I've been trying to talk to you about one of your assignments. So I don't know if you've gotten those from me, but, uh, uh, but I would like a moment to talk to you as well. Uh, so yes, send me those emails and we can discuss those things. Like if you, if you can't meet during off hours, then other arrangements can be made. All right, but that you will need to schedule because I just don't randomly get on Zoom. As, as fun as it is to be on Zoom, I'm not randomly on there. All right. Any other questions? All right. Have a good day. I uh, hope you guys had a good weekend, a safe weekend, and see you guys on Thursday. Professor. Yes. Uh, you said you wanted to talk to me, or did you want to just do it through email? Well, I, uh, we can either, if you want to stick around, then we can chat after this as, as people leave. Uh, but